Good evening, everyone. I'm going to uh, begin tonight's Conservation Commission meeting. I have 5.45, right on time. Uh, so we are meeting tonight here in the uh, Wakoyat Meeting Room, Thursday, November 16th, 2023, 16 Great Neck Road North. Our meeting is broadcast live on local cable channel 8, and we are also streamed live on the Town of Mashpee website. Uh, before we begin the meeting, if you would like to join me in a Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm going to move down the agenda to our discussion item and uh, take a moment to introduce Nicole Corbett from the Pompanesset Water Stewardship Alliance. Good evening, Nicole. Thank you for coming. Uh, yeah, Nicole's got for a presentation me. for us. Uh, so I'm going to just turn it over to you and I'll let you begin. Great. Thank you. No, thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Nicole Corbett. I am the founder, president, and executive director of the Papanesset Water Stewardship Alliance. Uh, I would like to thank the Conservation Commission for inviting me um, to give this presentation this evening. Um, just a little bit of info. We are a 501c3 nonprofit public charity um, focused on science education in uh, Papanesset is kind of our home base. But we do expand out um, to other areas along the Nantucket Sound coastline as well. A um, little bit of background about um, do you can <laughs> so a little bit of background about me. Um, so my grandparents have had a home in Papanesset since the late 1950s. I am from Abington. I would come to Papanesset during the summer months, and uh, when people come to Papanesset. This is what they see of Papanesset. So very pretty beach, um, you know, looks great in the summer. Uh, you can flip. This is what I see. So I am a very avid swimmer. I have been a big water fanatic since I was a small child. I grew up in a household of water quality scientists. So I have had a lot of exposure to um, water quality in terms of the chemistry of water, but also I just love to swim. So uh, I would get to see kind of Papanesset from a side that a lot of people didn't get to see Papanesset. Um, when I was a teenager, my parents got me an underwater camera and it was a big game changer because I could not only, when I got out of the water, I would tell everybody, oh, I saw this or I saw this animal and this and that. Um, I could photograph it and show people. So I started to take a lot of pictures of what I was seeing under the water. In the mid-2000s, what I started to see really started to change. So we started to get a lot of seaweed building up along the beach. And a lot of the seaweed was drift seaweed. It wasn't just seaweed stagnant or hanging um, around, some, or some of the traditional green seaweeds that we had seen. It was a lot of brown and red drift seaweed. And when I would get out of the water, I would actually be covered in like a sludgy decomp layer, which was very unpleasant, very smelly, and my parents threw me right in the shower, um, right when I got out. This was, this was the beginning of the changes that we started to see in this area. And additionally, the jellyfish populations really started to increase. So two kind of simultaneous issues for swimmers were say um, that were happening. So we can flip the slide. This didn't change. So from throughout the late 2000s through the 2010s, Papanesset would look like this very frequently. So we'd have large buildups of drift seaweed. It would stay along the coastline in the summer months. It would rot out and decompose. And this was not just also in Papanesset. This extended up the coastline to Barnstable as well. And when it decomposed, it would smell terrible. I, my grandparents' house is a mile and a quarter from some of the peak decomposition sites, and I could smell the decomp from my grandparents when you would step outside. Uh, I believe that plays a little video. <laughs> if, oh, on this it, slide? Yeah, yeah, if you click, yeah. I think if you just click. Oh, yeah, that's how it was. Anyways, 
the decomposition when it's not sideways looks pretty much like that. It's like a black tar sludge. That was what I ended up kind of covered in when I would come out of the water, but it ended up just kind of picking up in intensity. Slide. Yep. Uh, so in 2018, when I was swimming around one of the rock groins at Papanessa Beach, one of the mini jetties, so I was mentioning the seaweed um, just really has been piling up during the summer months. I was trying to navigate around one of the um, areas where it was built up, and I had a jellyfish get stuck between my bathing suit and my arm, wrapped around my arm, and it took quite a while to pull the entire jelly off. It sent me to Falmouth Hospital where I got to sit in the waiting room for two hours um, with no one knowing how to treat a jellyfish sting. So it was, that moment was a bit of a game changer for me because I had seen these changes happening along the way but I wasn't, it was kind of more me observing them, having some knowledge in science and then trying to put the pieces together as to what was going on. So during that fall and winter, I started contacting some of the uh, local scientists who were working on some water quality issues in the area. Came to learn not a lot of work was being done on Nantucket Sound, especially coastal Nantucket Sound. So together with some residents in Papanesset, we formed a small water testing committee. And I can flip this slide, Drew. Um, paired up with the Center for Coastal Studies in Provincetown and we started the first water quality testing program along coastal Nantucket Sound. So that water quality testing program is along Papanessa Beach. We have three test sites. Uh, I go out every two weeks and collect water samples and we're testing for some of the same stuff they're testing for in Papanessa Bay. So we're looking for nitrite, nitrate, and phosphates. And some of the idea behind this was for getting these really large buildups of drift seaweed could nutrients potentially be playing a role along coastal Nantucket Sound and really helping to fuel these inundations. Uh, and that's actually gonna, we built more along this as, um, along the way too. Uh, so you can flip the slide through. As we were water testing and running of our program, started getting very large drift uh, buildups of drift red seaweed building up along the beach in the middle of the winter. And bit of, you know, curiosity because the water is in the upper 30s to low 40s and we're getting a lot of seaweed. So by January 2000, so we noticed this in 2019 into 20 and then 2020 and 2021 again. By January 2021, it was getting pretty bad. Let me flip the slide, Drew. You can see how bad it got. So this is right along Papa Nesset's spit. Um, Bottom right corner is my lifelong best friend, Jill, who has tagged along with me during the entire process. And we, uh, it, it got really bad. So wasn't sure what exactly was going on here. We first had to ID what this species was. So the species turned out, we can even flip the slide, to be this species called Dassey Siphonia japonica. This is a red macroalgae or seaweed that's native to the Northwest Pacific. It was first reported in Europe in 1984. It likely came over on actually oyster aquaculture and then spread to the United States around 2009 and has been causing problems down um, along the Manhattan, a uh, little bit along Long Island, up into Narragansett Bay. So when we figured out what this species was, we figured out, or we saw that it was causing these really large inundations in Papanus. And this was not just in the winter, this was the species I had seen in the summer as well. It was just mixing with other species of seaweed at that time as well. We, I contacted uh, Coastal Zone Management for this, uh, the Office of Coastal Zone Management for the state. Said we have this red seaweed, it built up a lot, what do we do? And they said, we did not know that this species was in Nantucket Sound. You can't do anything about it. It's just a matter of sit and look. So, and hope that it eventually decomposes or maybe you haul it out. So there wasn't a lot that we could actually do. Contacted uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute and they have a harmful algal bloom lab there. And I got in contact with um, Don Anderson, uh, Dr. Don Anderson, who is the head of the lab and he said, Maybe we can develop some type of study to look into this. So during that time, we, I ended up collaborating with Woods Hole, Florida Atlantic University, University of New Hampshire, 
and the Center for Coastal Studies, and we developed uh, two proposals that we are still waiting for funding on. But we're trying to look and see potentially if there is a link between nutrient enrichment along coastal Nantucket Sound and this seaweed. So as we were getting that kind of going, I am a teacher in Abington, and I had, this was COVID, and we needed some fun things to do. So I had some students who had connections to Hyannis, and they said, why don't we try to see how far along the coastline this is? So we started a pretty vigorous social media campaign on some of the town Facebook pages along uh, Nantucket Sound, and we said, if anyone sees the seaweed, please send us a picture and a location sighting for it. That particular year, we were able to get, we got a lot of pictures in, and here were some of the pictures that we got from beaches in Barnstable, Mashpee, and Falmouth. One of my students, Kaylee Donaher, then would put them on a Google map, so we were able to map out where the seaweed was inundating at the time. I'm sure you can flip the slide. So we mapped it out. The peak inundation area was right nestled in between Barnstable and Papanesset. So that area had the heaviest inundations. But it did spread um, all the way from Hyannis Port down through Falmouth. But we were really in this sweet spot. We were just getting a lot more than those other areas. It would gradually thin out as it went down along the Falmouth coastline, and it was pretty much nothing once it hit Nobska Beach. I can flip. So it was from this uh, campaign that we actually started the Dassey Spotter Program. This is in collaboration with the Barnstable Clean Water Coalition. And the Dassey Spotter Program basically allows, we have these cards printed, and I uh, printed one for all the commissioners this evening as well, but I'm going to leave the stack up front of um, a, our desk in town hall for people to pick up. So these, Dassey Spotter Program allows you to scan a QR code, which goes to our Dassey monitoring form. And you can fill in information if you see the seaweed at your beach and we can kind of track where it is moving. This has been very useful because not only now are we seeing it um, in, along a lot of Nantucket Sound's coastline, but it is spreading outside of Nantucket Sound and is starting to head to beaches north of Cape Cod. So a few of the teachers I work with uh, go to beaches in Weymouth and Duxbury a lot and use the Dassey Spotter program last year to point out that had just started coming into some of these beaches up there as well. So this is a spreading species. I can, oh, sorry, I can flip the slides. Uh, that particular year, we did get a lot of uh, or a lot of attention for uh, when we first started seeing the seaweed. I did do that interview while I was eating lunch on the left, so I am not a fan of that headline. <laughs> but we did start getting a lot of attention. We also had some local uh, kids who were hybrid learning for COVID who wanted to help out. So Hans Brings, uh, he was at Zavarian at the time. He was hybrid learning, so he was down in Papanesset a lot. And he served as an intern for a couple months, and he hopped on his jet ski and went up and down. He goes everywhere. So he actually went all the way up and down Nantucket Sound's coastline. He was out in Martha's Vineyard. He went everywhere, but he would photograph wherever he saw the, sea, um, the seaweed and then report back. He was also able to get into areas that I was not easily able to access. Now you can flip. So because of this program that we developed around the um, Dassey Siphonia, which I should say we do nickname Dassey uh, for e ease of pronunciation, uh, we did end up attending a couple conferences, so I went up to the Benthic Ecology meeting in 2022 in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and talked about how we developed a basic a citizen science program locally that was starting to look at invasive species. Went to a conference at Woods Hole, and ironically, when I was at a conference at Woods Hole, I collaborated with a researcher out of Stony Brook University who was also studying DASI, also doing a study on the effects of runoff on DASI siphonia growth and found a positive correlation between uh, very, um, we'll say, anthropogenic runoff, particularly sewage-based runoff, and the proliferation of the species along Long Island. And this is our little team from the Barnstable Clean Water Coalition. Uh, Luke Cadron is on the right. His interns change up every year, but he has been a huge help uh, with our DASI program, but also some of the other work that we have been expanding out to. 
as you can flip the slide. So this year we started looking a little more at Papanessa Bay. Over the summer, I volunteered to be a water quality tester with uh, Mashpee DNR. And a big thanks to Buddy Popnet who drove me around on his boat. We went to the different test sites in Papanessa Bay. <coughs> Papanessa Bay was, I've known about uh, the problems with Papanessa Bay since I was very young. It actually inspired a lot of the science fair work I did in high school around the effects of nutrients on algae blooms. So Papanessa Bay, in addition to the water quality testing, which was really a great program to be part of, and if anyone, this is just saying, if anyone wants to volunteer to help test these sites, I, it was a real eye-opening experience and very valuable um, use of time. With the Barnesville Clean Water Coalition, they designed an underwater camera that models underwater cameras used by the EPA to do benthic studies. And so this is kind of a homemade project, but we've been dropping the camera down into um, areas in Papanessa Bay and areas in Nantucket Sound to map out the uh, types of seaweed that are growing at the bottom to see if there's different types of seaweed in Papanessa Bay versus different types of seaweed in Nantucket Sound. Really, originally, this was to see where this DASI was really coming from. Um, but along the way, we're starting to get really valuable information about what's in Papanessa Bay and the types of species that are also in Nantucket Sound. Our biggest problem over the summer has been what you're seeing on the right, a lot of decomposition in Papanessa Bay, the majority of the bottom of Papanessa Bay in the areas that are low, uh, have a low flow current are just solid black sludge. And when we dropped the camera down, you could not see a thing. It would just go into a plume. You try to wait for it to settle down. It was just a lot of sludge in there. So that was one of the complications we did run into this summer when we were trying this out. Um, a lot of that black sludge is actually caused by the seaweed here. This is Gracilari tafahe. It is a species that really proliferates in waters that have a lot of nutrients. It's really one of those last species that's the only one that's going to be left over. Uh, when nothing else really can grow anymore. So there's a lot of that that builds up and then becomes that decomp that you see at the bottom. So we've been doing, along with some other interns and some of the younger kids at the beach, a lot of kids bring their boogie boards. And I say, if you want to help out, flip your boogie board upside down so you have that um, white surface and kids will take the seaweed and put it on their boogie board and spread it out with some water and then they take pictures of the different species that they find. And we've been cataloging when we've been finding all different species, um, times a year, the different species that we find. One thing that we've been finding with this work is that a lot of the species that are washing into Papanessa Beach are not really beneficial species. We have what we call a mix of nuisance natives and invasive species and species that have moved up from the mid-Atlantic coastline and are establishing themselves in this area as well. Uh, along the way, when we were doing a lot of the DASI work, we found that a survey of pop, uh, excuse me, a survey of Nantucket Sound's seaweed has not been conducted since the 80s. So a lot has been kind of changing in that regard. Um, and if you kind of look at the um, what was published in the 80s versus what we're seeing now, there's definitely a big shift in the types and abundance of seaweed that you're finding along this area. And then we put all our findings on a little map and we've been mapping out the time of year that you find the type of seaweed, where we found it, etc. cetera. Um, so if we flip along. So the second, so the other big, this was, this was the focus of my summer here. So the jellyfish of Papanessa, but also I should say the jellyfish of Nantucket. So we have a mixture of jellyfish that have been really inundating these beaches. Uh, this, I started noticing, we'll say stinging jellyfish, really uh, causing, or becoming more frequent late 2000s, but this has really revved up over the last couple of years. So we have two species that we are looking at in particular, um, and I can highlight them on the next slide. On the next yep, slide. Yep, next one, yep. yep. Here's our first one. This is our moon jelly. So the moon jelly, I first saw a moon jelly when I was in high school in 2007. And I was very excited to see a moon jelly. I had not seen one kind of floating around Papanesset. Um, came to learn that this moon jelly is a little bit special in that it seems to have venom that is more potent than that of a common moon jelly. So we, I was always curious about this. 
And it also was getting very large in size. Over the last couple of years, the moon jellies in Papa Nested are getting to be about 15 inches across max uh, diameter. So you'll be able to go by one, it's like larger than the basketball and it's floating by. So the problem with these two is they're hanging around the midwater column, so a lot of people don't see these moon jellies when they try to come to the surface. And actually, if you flip the slide, we can watch a little video of one. You hit play. There it goes. I'm not going to get hired by any National Geographic <laughs> outlets with some of my video quality, but if you watch them swim along, what they end up trying to do is they try to come to the surface in Nantucket Sound and float on the surface. So it's going to try to make a U-turn now and flip up. When it tries to make it to the surface, the surface is too rough and it senses that it's too rough. It turns back around and hangs around the middle of the water column. So a lot of people are not seeing these moon jellies in the water. But they are very abundant. There are days I'll be counting about 50 or so moon jellies in a half mile stretch of beach and they just hang in the, hang in along that area. So I was very curious about these moon jellies. Didn't really investigate it too much further. I was an intern at the New England Aquarium asked if you know, I was talking about the size of the moon jellies, the potency of the venom. New England Aquarium didn't know what to make of it when I was an intern there. They have one of the largest moon jelly exhibits in the country. They hadn't heard of anything that I was saying and talking about. In 2009, uh, no, excuse me, 2021, David Remsen from the Marine Biology Lab at Woods, uh, Woods Hole, it's affiliated with the University of Chicago, that came out um, to Papanesset and said that you really need to investigate these moon jellies further. I would recommend getting them barcoded. So genetically barcoding means to take tissue samples and have it genetically analyzed. So we crowdfunded a small study in Papanesset and had tissue samples from these moon jellies sent to Northeastern University's Ocean Genome Legacy Center and got the barcode back. The barcode is currently being worked on at the University of California, and this coming summer we're likely going to do a large study with the University of California to get a complete genetic profile of this moon jelly and to compare it to other moon jellies up and down the East Coast. Yes. What, is it, what do you mean by barcode? Um, so it's the genetic, what they do is they take a strand of the RNA and they're able to sequence it. That sequence is unique to you know, every, every species on Earth has a unique right. code right there. Oh. So you're able to distinguish if there's different species that are popping up with that. Thank yes. So we're going to do a large study and we're going to have several researchers collaborating with us along the East Coast and do a cross comparison of moon jelly barcodes and see if the different ones are popping up. So that'll be coming summer 2024. The second story with the jellies were these ones. So this jellyfish is called the Atlantic Bay Nettle. This I first saw it in 2016 in, at Papanesset Spit when I was swimming off the spit. And I turned to the right and I looked and I go, is that a sea nettle? And I thought that something weird had washed in. I had never seen one before. Turned out that that was the start of this population of this species just exploding in this area. So the Atlantic Bay nettle originally originated in the mid-Atlantic around the Chesapeake Bay region. It was actually first discovered in 2017 because two researchers at, affiliated with the University of Delaware, but they work at the Smithsonian, decided to barcode this. And they learned it was not the sea nettle, it was actually a bay nettle and genetically different. These are an estuary species. They thrive in waters of low salinity. So this round, this was the one that had stung me in 2018 and ended up sending me to Falmouth Hospital. This summer, I saw one of these very early on. Usually I see them the last two weeks of August. That time has been expanding. I saw one this year in the middle of July and it was enormous. So usually they're about two feet long. This was four feet long. It was a very large bay nettle, and I said that it, I thought it was a sea nettle at that time too, and I thought that it was just one that had washed in. Throughout July, through the first part of August, the bay nettle in Papanesset, every single one I saw was at least four feet long. And their sting was very, was bad. So when people were getting stung, they were getting, it felt like a chemical burn, and it was lasting quite a long time on people. 
Uh, if you flip the slide, we, so the one, the, so this is one of the big ones, yep. Those. You can see how long these are. It's the bell. Those tentacles go all the way back. They're like little violin strings, so they're very hard to see in the water. Uh, this almost made the beach unswimmable some days because there were just so many of them. By August, most of the population had shifted to be smaller bay nettle, but we, I started, I was curious why they got so big. So what we ended up doing um, last couple months is I found two researchers who found, who discovered the bay nettle, I reached out to them. In September, I collected uh, tentacle samples from three bay nettle. Those currently are at the Smithsonian. They are getting genetically barcoded to confirm that these are in fact the bay nettle. This is going to be the first confirmed bay nettle sighting and bay nettle reporting in Nantucket Sound. They did not know that their range had expanded this far north. So in response to all of our jellyfish stings, in 2021, I tried to roll out this jellyfish sting kit program in Papineset as a pilot. I talked to the University of Hawaii. They have the premier jellyfish venom lab there. And we, I purchased um, a bunch of these Sting No More kits. It is kind of a vinegar-based spray, but it's stabilized so the heat doesn't impact it. A uh, cream that is acidic but also has hydrocortisone in it and a heat pack. The heat pack is actually key. The heat pack helps to neutralize venom because heat at 115 degrees has been shown to help neutralize jellyfish venom. Roll these out along East Street along Papanesset Beach and had sponsors for each street. So I said, if you want to sponsor your kits, we put the kits together. It was just as price. I put them in little boxes and just had people pay for the materials in the box. Each one has a QR code, so we're able to see which streets are having the worst problems with the jellyfish and. Um, overall, you know, what the population's are looking like for that year. Didn't expect this kit, uh, this program to be as successful, successful as it is. It has gotten a lot of positive feedback in Papanesset. So if you flip the slide, you can see our little form that people fill out. I will say, uh, during our peak jellyfish inundations this summer, we had kits that were just, this is just the one that was scanned. So not everyone scans it. Some people run and grab the kit and are like just using it really quick. Just the ones that were scanned, we um, were running out of supplies weekly, but I had kits scanned up to 30 times in one week. Is there a reason why there's more jellyfish this year than previous This year? is kind of what we're, there's a couple theories, and I'll actually talk about that really quick in a sec. So I'm gonna flip the slide, I'll kind of talk a little, okay. So currently we've got two projects going, we've got with our jellyfish, the Ocean Genome Legacy Center, University of California, and the University of Hawaii is actually involved because they actually have our venom from our moon jelly. So my neighbors were very kind when I was at open house for my school to grab me a moon jelly in a bucket. <laughs> I got to take the tentacles off. And uh, my neighbors are very supportive. They could be, so I think that Papaness, it's, uh, become interested in this a little bit. So we um, have the venom sent to the University of Hawaii for analysis to see what is going on with the moon jelly venom. Smithsonian currently has the bay nettle. Uh, that was the last bay nettle I saw on October 28th. So these were in the water from mid-July through the end of October. So they had a very good season. So some things we are finding with these very bad jellyfish years in 2021 and 2023. There is a the um, hypothesis right now uh, pertaining to the bay nettle that bay nettle are triggered, population explosions or booms, are triggered by an increase in their food. They eat comb jellies, which eat copepods in the water. People were out on the bay, Papanesset Bay or at Papanesset Beach this summer, we were scooping up comb jellies by the fistful. These species bloom the food sources when you have years of heavy runoff. We had a lot of rain this summer. 2021, we also had a lot of rain. This could have triggered a boom in that food web or the food chain for them, which could cause them to proliferate more. Second thing with the bay nettle, I had a uh, meeting with Bar the Save Our Barnegat Bay in New Jersey. They had a, had a problem with the bay nettle going on almost a decade. Their hypothesis down there is that increased hardscape in the bays is actually serving as a nursery for these jellyfish. If you look at the uh, bay nettle right there, that frilly center is called the oral arms. The oral arms are covered in eggs on the female. 
The female's gonna release those eggs in the water, they're gonna stick to hard surfaces. These jellies like calm waters that are low salinity. The, we have a lot of bays along our coastline. They're also looking for hardscape. So those eggs are looking to anchor to hardscape because those eggs are gonna develop into little suction cup polyps there, the baby jellies. Eventually they transform into that jellyfish that you see there. So Barnegat Bay right now is running a program where they're attempting to use underwater pressure washers to clean off everybody's dock. And they are, this is a three year program. They're coming out with the results in a couple months. They have to analyze the data. They're gonna see if this causes the pop, helps the population to go down because the idea is as, we're, as there's an increase in hardscape on these bays, there may be increase in area for nurseries for these jellyfish. In 2022, we had a drought. We had a very low number of jellyfish along the beaches. So there may be a correlation between runoff, nutrient-rich runoff. There's also a drop in salinity that happens in these bays, and these jellyfish are triggered to emerge by a drop in salinity, um, as well as increasing hardscape in these embayments. In, in Papanesset Bay, I will say when I was in there doing the water testing, the little ones were all over the place in there. So when they were very small, they were very prolific in Papanese Bay in areas where you're not getting a lot of current flow. So they weren't washing in from the Nantucket Sound. So they were all hanging in Papanese Creek. There was quite a few. Um, okay, almost done. So we mentioned kind of what's going on. Um, over the summer, uh, Alex from the um, Mashpee Enterprise came out and did a little interview. And I mentioned that what I think is happening is we have a perfect storm of circumstances. Nantucket Sound, Papanesset Bay, Wakoit Bay are getting very warm. Uh, water, when I do water testing, I have to do temperature checks right along the coastline. Uh, hit the mid 80s in July this year on our YSI probe. It was very warm, granted it's very shallow along that coastline, but it was very warm very early this year. Last summer, it was in the eight, uh, we had 85 in during a week in August. Um, that week, the beach almost closed for bacteria. So it's getting very warm. We have nutrient issues in our embayments. This could be playing a role. Uh, Alex asked when he was out, when we were at, um, when he took that picture on the left, it was at uh, Papanesset Spit. And he says, is this how bad the seaweed gets? I said, you're actually in between what could be two really bad times. Ironically, a month later, that's what Papanesset spit looked like on the right. So that's all Codium fragile. That's an invasive species. It has been Papanesset's signature seaweed since the 50s, but I had never seen that much Codium fragile in my years in Papanesset, and I don't think many other people have either. It had a very good growing year. So that was, um, that actually impacted the dredge operation there because they had to clear that before they could get the dredge started again. So where we go from here, uh, where our organization, we're gonna continue, we have our water quality program that has been continuing with the Center for Coastal Studies. We're continue to, continuing to build our DASI spotter program, so um, I will be leaving a stack of cards if anyone in town would like to take one at the town hall. And we've got our moon jelly study, but we've got a lot of other um, jellyfish projects that are likely coming as well as we get more information back from um, some of the institutions we reached out to. Uh, we may be doing a fun project over the summer uh, where we're going to try to make settling plates that people can hang on their docks and have them analyzed so you can see what organism may be growing on your dock and have them sit next to the, some of the docks for people who volunteer. So this is a project uh, we might, we're might we gonna try to roll out. We got um, inspiration from Save Our Barnegat Bay and they've been doing this program for a couple of years. And additionally, um, because I'm an education uh, nonprofit, just one last slide right after that. Um, we do teacher workshops, so we ran our first teacher workshop last spring. Um, I'm Teacher works, I am PDP pro provider certified through um, DESE, so the Department of Ed. So I work in Abington, and I asked the superintendent, I said, I'm piloting like, this teacher workshop program. You think if there'd be any interest? And he said, take your, take your department. Every, all the science teachers come down. So we had our science teachers out in the boats with uh, Barnstable Clean Water Coalition. We went around and did the Dassey Spotter program. We dropped the camera in Papanesset Bay. And uh, they went over to Barnstable to see their restoration projects in Cranberry Bogs. So that has been 
And that was a fun program um, because we have that PDP uh, provider certification. Uh, I can roll this out to all schools now. So we didn't at the time, but now we have it. We have it. So um, any school can participate in our education programs. Um, and that's pretty much it. I just got just a few acknowledgement slides at the end of this. So this is all of our researchers who have helped us out along the way. This has been a I will say I started this program with a couple sample bottles from the Center for Coastal Studies. And we built it into a pretty large research and education operation that we're continuing to build on. But a lot of people who are, um, have been amazing to work with have helped us out along the way. So this is a list of some of the people who have been helping us out. And then we have a series of volunteers. Oh. In Papa Nesson on the next slide. Uh, so these are our volunteers. A uh, big thanks to Barnesville Clean Water Coalition. They, I reached out to them um, a couple of years ago explaining some of the ideas that I had. And Luke uh, Kadron was just becoming a field operations manager and he has been helping me drive around the boat and help me out all the time out in the wherever I need to get a boat from one place to another and been helping with the Dassey Sprouter program and organizing interns. So we have a lot of support. From the community, um, my school even has um, provided a lot of support, so it's been it's been great. And the last slide is just our social media links. Anyways, oh, I formatted funny, but anyways, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter slash X, and we're on Instagram, and we have a website, uh, Poppy Water Alliance. Um, that's our email, and our website's at poppywater.org. And that is it. Well, thank you, Nicole. No, thank you. I went a little over my time. It's quite a project you've got going there. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll take just a couple of minutes if yeah. there are a few questions from commissioners. I don't know. Um, so the um, seaweed, is that growing out in the Nantucket Sound? So the Dassey, the red one, is prevalent in Nantucket Sound. It's also in the bay in areas where um, basically that decomposition isn't happening. So areas where it's able to get clean access, like a nice clean substrate to sit on and access to enough light from the surface. Yes, that's where it is. It's also, um, interestingly enough, been growing more inshore over the last several years. So if you go even along those rock jetties or groins and pop and it, it's all over those as well. So wherever it's able to get hard surface, with just enough access to light, it's proliferating. What is your like confidence level in that correlation between water, you know, warmer temperatures and and the jellyfish population? I think it's I'm pretty confident that there's a correlation. Those jellyfish are all conveniently emerging when the water's hitting the eighties. So those bay nettle this year came out in July. Our water temperature hit the 80s in mid-July, and conveniently, the bay nettle start coming out. Uh, usually, that doesn't happen until August. And August is when we hit the 80s, and then you start seeing them emerge. The concerning thing about the jellyfish is just their longevity. So originally, when I was younger and used to see the moon jellies, for instance, it was two weeks at the beginning of August, and you go, this is moon jelly week, and then we're clear for the summer. Then the bay nettle were introduced to the equation. They occupied the last two weeks of August, so now you've got August is jellyfish month. Then everybody starts shifting their schedule a little bit into July, so the moon jellies start shifting to July. This year, the bay nettle decided to shift to July. Their seasons are overlapping and now we're going into October. So both of them I saw through October. And are there any um, predators out like uh, that, that, prey, that prey on the jellyfish? I know uh, we, can get a, we can get typically. a sea turtle and a mola molar in here. Yeah. <laughs> the mola molar probably will not swim very well around right. getting them, but right. uh, if we can get an army of sea turtles, yeah. that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> but um, one of the big factors likely is just going to be that enhanced food chain as well. If you're, right. there's, um, the comb jellies this year, like I said, I was pulling them out by the, I had some, a, a couple of the little kids on the beach and we were just scooping them out by the fistful and throwing them to buckets. There was a lot of comb jellies. And comb jellies, do they, uh, do they sting as well? No, they're actually not a true jellyfish. They are a tinafore, which is in the family of jellyfish. So they do not sting, um, they're harmless. But up to us, they sting what's around in the water around them, but we can't feel it. Uh, but they are actually predators to oyster larvae. Oh wow! 
So uh, one of the theories that they're looking at in Barnegat Bay, too, is could hypothetically some bay nettle help to regulate a comb jelly population, which could help regulate, um, help with oyster aquaculture. So that's another piece, but uh, the big curiosity that's going to be um, with all of this is just the size of the ones we saw this summer. Because sure. I, when I sent those to the Smithsonian, when I sent the pictures to Barnegat Bay, no one had ever seen one to get wow. to that size. Wow. And what's going to be interesting in this area is that because our embayment, our closed embayments empty out into a very large embayment, Nantucket Sound. Basically, you're going from a bay to another bay. Down in New Jersey, or along a lot of the mid-Atlantic, they're not going from bay to a bay, they go to the open ocean. So if those jellyfish wash out, they're in the ocean. Right. Here, they're kind of stuck in another embayment. Could they be getting larger once they, is there more food in that particular embayment right. when they're in there? Could salinity allow them to also, could that be playing a role in sure. how they change? Yeah. So all questions yeah. that yeah. Yeah. would be interesting to find out. Yeah. Um, just one last comment for me is uh, I'm impressed with the way that you have it set up so you can track the stations and see where the stings are happening with yeah. different frequencies. That's really, I think that's really beneficial no. for public, yeah, public no. safety. And, yeah. okay. Thank you. No, it's been helpful also when people, like they empty the kits. This is going to be our 2.0 kit, I'm hoping. So we made them very bright so people yeah, can yeah. see them. But yeah. um, we're going to try some... Um, different vinyl too. One of my former students who is currently in community college for graphic design actually did all the art for these last two slides. She's a very, very talented artist. Uh, she designed the artwork for the front of our original kits, but we had we did them very, um, what was I going to say, um, kind of last, not last minute, but we didn't, uh, we had like stickers and tape when we were trying to hold them onto the boxes to try to identify them so people knew what the box was, but we're going to try vinyl this year and try some different things. And Nicole, what's the cost per kit? So um, the kits go high. So they're $72 because we had to pay for the box, but we also, the inside those, that Sting No More kit is $52 from the University of Hawaii and then the printing costs and then putting everything together, plus the shipping from Hawaii too. And then how many of those do you deploy along the shore? We deployed 14 along Papanesset Beach, two went to Papanesset Spit. Uh, Papanesset Spit is our hot spot, by the way, for stings. It is, that is our kit that gets emptied. That was getting emptied daily this summer. We had to send a second kit over there and said, send volunteers. Um, one of the girls who was helping us was from Boston Latin, um, and she, I was texting her and I said, I need you to go back to the spin, <laughs> refill that kit again, because it is getting emptied like crazy. Um, so we, yep, so we deployed 14 along Papanesa <clears throat> Beach and Yep, some do get more that use more than others, but. And is that grant funded or donation funded? How we have sponsors along the beach, so sponsors for each street and a sponsor for the spit. So if there's people along the beach who will say, hey, I'd like to be sponsored for this jelly kit. Mm -hmm. so, okay, so um, we'll put the jelly kit together as long as we have a sponsor for that street. Every street in Papanesset along the beach except one has a kit. And is there a way to donate on your website? Um, we're going to set some. We're going to get that when we get these all set up this year. We're going to set up. Yeah, a so I think program. as the word gets out, especially next summer, if we have another warm, wet summer, right. you're going to need more kits. We're going to need. Yep. Yeah, no, we're we're yeah. preparing. Great. So in a, yeah, no, we actually rolled one out or a couple out uh, last year as well to to it. So some from yeah. people from Katua reached out for a couple kits over there too. So we're willing to expand it outside of Papanesset. So any other beaches, if we can get just a coordinated volunteer program for people to check the kits and restock and have a stock mm -hmm. supply, we're willing to roll that out to other beaches. Okay. Well, again, thank you. I really appreciate no, you coming you. in and yeah. sharing your no, knowledge. Thank you. Thank talents. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good talk with Nicole all night, but we have business to, <laughs> <laughs> business to conduct. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm going to back up to the uh, beginning of our agenda, and uh, before I start any of the hearings, if there is anyone in the audience that would like to address the commission uh, via public comment for anything that is not listed on our agenda tonight, this would be the time. I don't think so. Nobody online drew for that? Um, how should I see? Does anyone uh, participating over Zoom have any comments about any topics that are not listed on the agenda or 
associated with any hearings today? Okay. Okay. All right. Then I think I'll move right to the first hearing. I'm going to call the six o'clock hearing for 26 Wheeler Road, 26 Wheeler Road LLC. This is a proposed removal of 20 infested pitch and white pine trees. The representative is the owner of record, self. This is continued from July 27th, August 24th, and October 5th. This is a RDA. So if we have someone, yes. Hey. Good evening. Can I have your name for the record, please? Ronald Ganjemi. So where are we with the um, um, I, I think you got, I gave all the paperwork for the plantings to Stacy the other day, so you should have them all there. Yes, I've got yeah. it. Yeah. It's not Don't sure rely on the screen for now. That's <laughs> what's on okay. um, I'm going to start with the, um, the berm that you have here. Um, it's a proposed two foot high berm and it's six foot, or excuse me, eight foot wide. Um, is that proposed to be vegetated as well? And if so, with what? Probably, um, I, I don't know, mulch. I, I, the guy that designed the plan, just uh, you asked for a berm and we gave you right. a berm. Whatever you want to put on there, we're, we'll do it. Yeah. So I don't know if you want to put mulch or some plantings there, add them on. I don't think mulch will do us much good. A couple of no. rainstorms and that Wash away, yeah. yeah so so some, some, some plantings, if you want to just add them on there, that's fine. Okay. I don't own the land anymore. I'm just trying to help my, the, the neighbor that bought it. So, um, but you filed the, the request. I filed it, and then at that time I, I sold it. I had no intention of selling it, and then yeah, somebody came by and wanted to buy it, and I sold it to him. So, I filed it, and at that time it wasn't sold. Okay. Um, I'll go to other commissioners for questions that you might have based on what we have for the drawings and litigation that's proposed. Um, yeah, so one of the questions I had is the number of plants. So according to this plan, it just shows like a line of plants going from, you know, east to west on the plan. So, but then when I was out there, that it's like cleared for, you know, at least 100 feet, maybe more back, 150 feet back. So, I. You know, there's some understory there, but so just saying, okay, what's going to be planted in that whole area? And this plant's not really not showing it. That's that was my question. That I had on it. Uh, I just hired somebody to do it because I had no idea what you guys wanted. So I have no idea. You know, I, I know we had. Uh, did he put the sand on the? I never even looked at the plants. I dropped them off the minute they got them. Okay. So, like, yeah, I, I didn't see the site before the trees were cut, but I'm assuming that the trees were cut probably from the beach back over 100 feet or? Uh, no, they were, they were all, um, what is it, boar beetle. So when um, Drew came by, I had a bunch of down trees, and then we noticed, you know, the trees were dying, you know, so um, he instructed me we could take them down and take them down because um, he doesn't want them around, pull the stumps, and we just... Um, cleared what we had to declare. So there was probably, I'm not even sure amount of trees, but maybe 11 trees that were, um, had the boar beetle in it, plus the two that were down already. Right, so then yeah, you brought in equipment to take out the stumps and to move the logs out, so all the whole, understory in that whole area got disturbed? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the stumps are huge, so. Yeah, I'm just, 
concern that, okay, if the, all the end of the story gets disturbed and the plankton plant only shows a little strip of plants, so, you know. Can I make a comment? Yeah. yeah. Uh, there really wasn't any understory. Well, that, okay. Uh, no. It was just mm -hmm. trees. Just trees, yeah. okay. Yeah, there really wasn't much of an understory prior to. Okay. And just to, you know, remind the commissioners of what happened here, this was um, the reason why the commission wanted to see a planting plan is normally under circumstances where you have trees that are infested, you know, health is compromised. Um, you know, our department gives out administrative approval for the removal of those trees, and we don't typically require mitigation for that because it's beyond the control of the landowner. It's a natural occurrence. Um, so typically work like this uh, doesn't trigger mitigation, but because of the scale of the number of trees in this particular instance, that's why the commission wanted to see some uh, mitigation plantings. And I, I understand where you're coming from as far as like what you see visually on the plan, but this will need to be done in accordance with the protocols under Regulation 12, which is kind of a clustered, non-landscape, not a nice, neat, orderly sort of, you know, layout like you see on the plan. So what you see there is not really what's going to occur in reality. It, okay. it is going to be in a more kind of, you know, clumped, natural sort of setting. Uh, and I'll provide you with that information as far as how the planting methodology should go. Uh, where the spacing, what the spacing should be like, it's all spelled out under Regulation 12. So this doesn't really represent what's going to occur in reality. Okay. But okay. at least, you know, it furnishes us with the information as far as the numbers and species, which are, I have some comments on, you know, some recommendations. Right. So summing out some of the species that you see here with, with uh, other types of vegetation, but that's kind of like the Okay. Just, no, thanks for the clarification. Sure. Yeah, I couldn't tell from yeah, looking at the plan and site, and yeah, like yeah. you said, you were there before. I was there before, yeah, and yeah, it was really just, there, there really wasn't any shrubs there. It was all just trees, and there might have been some green briar here and there, but that was about it for okay. that part. Yeah. Thanks, Drew. Yeah. Any other questions? So, mm -hmm. there'll be more plantings if we require it on the berm besides what is here. Correct, yeah. Aaron, any questions? Um, I'll take questions from the public if there's anyone that has a question or comment. No? Okay, Drew, I'll come back to you. Sure. Um, so my only uh, recommendation was that a couple of the species here, um, low bush blueberry, let's look at my notes here just to make sure. So what we typically like to see, Ron and I, I probably should have shared this with you prior to this plan being made, but it's not a big deal. Um, I, I recommend just swap, swapping out some of the species that you have on the list here with uh, a species called Amelanchia or Shadbush. Okay. It's uh, a more of an overstory species and mitigation, the whole, you know, um, kind of spirit of the mitigation regulation or more accurately requirements is that uh, we like to see um, a good combination of under of ground cover, understory, midstory, and overstory planting. So, what you have here is mostly ground cover and low story uh, vegetation. You know, low growing shrubs. So, I want to have some not large trees. I have a a pretty small, uh, doesn't grow particularly tall, but it'll provide that um, kind of vegetative strata that we look for. And mitigation really should incorporate you know a variety of of different types of vegetative strata. So, you know, three to four shad bush uh, kind of, you know, put in there to provide that would, would make for a better mitigation variety overall. Okay. Easy enough to just So it's the best just to come see you in. Yeah, we can, we can just help you, you know, um, we do a site visit and go out and just point to okay. what areas would be, you know, appropriate for citing those, right. uh, that type of vegetation. It might be with the new owners. I'm, I'm trying to help them out, but we'll, we'll yeah, figure out what we can do. You want to do it as well. um, yeah. Did he put this, uh, you know, as I said, I never looked at the plans. I got them, and they needed them pretty quick because I was <laughs> running late. Uh, do, do we have the beach? Does, I remember we, um, you guys agreed with putting sand 50 feet from there. Did he even put that on the plan? Uh, I didn't see it. No, but I know that that was something that you had 
mentioned yes. in the initial. And I don't yeah. think there was any issue with that. No, I it think was, you guys, as long as it was, you know, yeah, basically. Again, I think we can just kind of work with, you know, during the on-site okay. to, to identify those areas. And maybe this plan can just be amended just for record keeping to show where the sand is going to sure. go. And I think that should be fine. So basically, go see you, get it straightened out. Do I have to come back here again? I don't think so. It's up to the commission to decide okay. that. No, I'll, I'll entertain a motion. Uh, it's an RDA, so. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, make a motion for a negative determination for a 26 Wheeler Road, 26 Wheeler Road, LLC, uh, with the um, Conditions to change the planting to shad bush as recommended by the agent and to work with staff on uh, plantings and protocols. And was it they mentioned beach nourishment? Is that uh, uh, putting down sand is just kind of cover over existing cover. soil uh, in right. certain areas? Yeah, so. yeah, okay. So, thank you, Aaron. So, the motion is made and seconded. Any discussion on that motion by commissioners? Hearing none, I'll take a Roll call vote, Steve? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Sandy? Yes. I vote yes as well. Motion carries. So <coughs> you're all set as far as a negative determination, and you can contact uh, staff, conservation department, and take okay. it from there. It's probably going to be in December. I'm taking off for a couple of weeks, so. Um, I wouldn't imagine you're going to do these plants until the spring anyway. No, we're not going to, no. He's, yeah. 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 So, but I'll catch up with you this winter. That's it might fine. be a little quieter for you, too. So. Sure. Yeah. Um, great. <laughs> okay. Thank you so yeah. much. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Enjoy your night. I will call the 603 hearing for 31 Birch Way, Gary J. Nagel and Denise M. Nagel, trustees. This is a proposed raise and replace existing garage with an added porch. The representative is Engineering Works Incorporated, and this is an RDA. Good evening. Good evening, sir. How are you? I'm fine. Can I Mike Canada. Michael Canada. I'm here on behalf of the homeowners. I'm the builder on the project. I came before the board. Uh, a few months ago, I drew his recommendation uh, to determine the appropriateness of an RDA filing for this project, um, and you guys all said it was definitely appropriate. Yeah. So here I am. I had Steve Magenty do all the engineering um, that you see before you. The situation, you probably don't remember, but the situation is the project is more, um, is more uh, it, by need than, than uh, desire. We have a garage and a breezeway on the front of the existing house that was built in the late 70s um, on top of a stump pile. And the stumps have since rotted, so that part of the building has major structural issues and it needs to come down and be rebuilt. Um, so all of this work that's gonna take place is within your jurisdiction, but it is within a 100 and 150 foot mark of the BVW. Um, there isn't any work on the top of the bank being done. It's all on the street side of the existing dwelling and the existing dwelling will stay standing, um, you know, as a buffer, if you will, between, yeah, you can see the garage right there. So we're gonna be on the street side. There is no vegetation removal um, to be had. The only thing we're taking up there is the driveway, that walkway and some of the front lawn that exists. So there is no tree removal, no shrub removal, no vegetation removal whatsoever to to take place here. We just need to take down the garage and breezeway and dig down and dig out all the stumps that are rotting below the foundation and bring in, you know, compacted fill that we can rebuild on top of. So that's the scope of work. Um, I think it's pretty straightforward. It's not quite as exciting as the jellyfish story, but um, <laughs> it's pretty more exciting once you get yeah, those stumps. Yeah. It's pretty straightforward. So um, so I guess I'm here looking to seek your approval for an RDA filing for this particular job. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Um, I think I'll start off on this one. I was out on the site yesterday, and mm -hmm. if you're facing the garage, mm -hmm. I'm looking on the right-hand side, there's a jog in the building where the garage meets the building. There's a Anderson slider of some kind. Yep, there. yep. There's a small... Um, 
rain gutter at the top with a downspout. It uh -huh. looks to be like a little bit of a water issue going on in that corner. Yep. And I'm wondering when you finally get this building out of there, is there some kind of a plan to take the water runoff from that roof in that corner and divert it into a dry well? Yeah, we can put it into a dry well up beside the driveway if you want, sure. Yeah, because you get yeah. your septic up front. The you septic is in the front water. yard, yeah. The septic is relatively new. It's a few years old. The house um, changed ownership in the last, I want to say, five years or so. So the septic mm -hmm. was done um, at that point. But yeah, there's no reason that that downspout can't go into a dry well. Right. Yeah. And I don't, I don't see any um, roof lines for the garage, but I assume there's going to be water. I have the architectural plans with me, oh, so do. if you're welcome to look at them, I can pass them around. You can kind of see. Yeah, there might be a little bit of concern. Uh, a frame, I would assume. Yeah, there's a gable facing the street. Yeah. So it looks like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So we'd probably want to get some drains off of that as yeah, well into a, we a dry well. Dry wells on both sides. Yeah, that, I think that would be the way to go. Sure. Yep. No okay. Yeah, I'll second. Thanks. They might want to see that as well, Mike, over there. I didn't have. I have questions with that after the no Can I ask a dumb question? Sure. No such thing. What's a stump pile? What do you mean? So, so, what's the well, it's kind of a bad faux pas. Well, it's kind of a bad faux pas. Uh, I hate to throw my, my uh, retired peers under the bus here, but back in the, in the day when uh, guys would clear lots to build, they would save money by not trucking out all the stumps and trees. And they dig a giant pit and they bury it in the, in the front yard. It was a common practice by the not so reputable builders. Okay. And so they get their check, it's all cleared, they're long gone, they're retired. 30 years later it all rots and, and this is under the foundation and then it starts to sink. And you get these sinkholes and the, the foundation has fallen seven inches from where it was originally Put and the, the ridge line on the roof is like this. Well, you were there looking at the door. Did you see how oh, I did. how bad yeah. it's yeah. bad? So it needs to come down and all that all that debris and wood pulp. We brought in an engineering firm because I I was suspecting that that was the problem when I was first called to the site. And so we did core samples around the base of the foundation and down as deep as 16 feet. There's wood pulp. So we got to dig deep and get all that garbage out and put suitable structural fill back in there and compact it. And so, like I said, it was not something they wanted to do. It's something they kind of have to do. Yeah. So, so that's where we stand with that. Any other questions from commissioners? Any questions from people in the audience? None. Drew, would you like to? Comment? Nothing more to know that drainage was the only. Comments I have that's been addressed. So. Okay. Great. Then I would accept a motion. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I make a motion for 31 Birchway, Gary J. Nagel, and Denise M. Nagel, trustees, for negative determination on the RDA and the only condition to add um, all roof uh, runoff from the new garage direct into the drywalls. Thank you. Second. Thank you, Karen. Motion made and seconded. Any discussion by commissioners on the motion itself? <coughs> We're all good? Okay. Take a roll call vote, Steve? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Sandy? Yes. I vote yes as well. Motion carries. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks. Good luck. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. <laughs> Almost as exciting as the jellyfish. <laughs> Not as exciting as the jellyfish. I learned a lot. You know what? She reaffirmed my reason to stay in the lake and out of the, out of the ocean. <laughs> I can tell you that. <laughs> no jellyfish things for me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. I'm going to call the 606 hearing for 275 Quinnipusset Avenue, Southworth Management Properties, LLC. This is a proposed construction and maintenance of 14 single family homes with paved driveway, sidewalk, drainage systems, and associated. Utilities. <coughs> Representative is Baxter Knight, Engineering and Surveying. This is continued from 
Five four six fifteen seven thirteen nine twenty one and ten nineteen. It's a notice right. of intent. DEP number four three three two three seven. Good evening. Uh, good evening. Uh, for the record, Matthew Eddy, professional engineer with Baxter and I Engineering and Surveying. Uh, thank you for uh, having me tonight. Um, so we are back here from uh, October 19th when uh, we submitted the revised plans with the full uh, grading and stormwater management uh, revisions established. You then authorized the peer review to proceed. Uh, so we're back here uh, for that peer review aspect. Um, we just received the peer review uh, letter today. It was done as a preliminary letter. I did have a chance to go through it. Um, I'm more than happy to kind of touch on anything that you might want to or if there's any questions. But real quick, um, just in going through the letter, um, I thought it was fairly straightforward and I didn't have, uh, you know, any significant, uh, you know, concerns, I'll say, with it. Um, just a few items I would like to note. Um, I talk about the... Uh, 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 expounding on the uh, regula regulatory compliance aspect and performance standards, we absolutely will uh, provide that. Um, we'll be following up with Mass DEP, obviously, as this, it was really that last submission, if you recall, with, you know, because we're working with the planning board and the submission that we made in October to really kind of advance the peer review. That was really kind of the kickoff of a lot of these things, you know, starting to come together, trying to, you know, work efficiently on how we move this process along, uh, you know, for the applicant. Um, so, you know, with that, um, addressing the peer review comments, coordination with DEP, uh, we'll move forward. Um, I think they did note, uh, and, you know, we will determine this, but it was noted that they weren't sure that with the wetland fill that we're proposing, which is under 5,000 square feet for bordering vegetated wetland, which is potentially allowed. Obviously, DEP has to approve that. You have to approve that. It's not an absolute, um, but I believe and right in the DEP's comments um, that the mitigation aspect uh, can include replication or restoration. I know there was a, a comment in there about it might need to be restoration, or I'm sorry, replication versus restoration where we're proposing to restore the uh, bogs, if you recall. Um, so again, we'll work through that. And this, this, I have a few thoughts on that if we need to kind of adjust uh, strategies and approaches. Um, but again, we'll work through that as, as we uh, address the comments, and we'll work with LEC on that as well. Um, the wetland delineation, I saw that they had a, a few comments on the uh, wetland delineation and hung an additional flag. I did forward the letter as soon as I received that, along to uh, Brad Holmes at uh, ECR, uh, who did the wetland delineation, so I will coordinate with him. And I think it'll probably make sense for uh, Brad and uh, Mark or somebody from LEC. They can meet on site and take a look at the comments that they had regarding the wetland delineation. Um, I think, again, just kind of the, to the point about uh, the BBW impacts and the uh, wetland replication versus restoration, I think, you know, what our approach was on this, and, um, you know, maybe Drew can speak to it as well. We've had a lot of dialogue, as you know, over the last year and a half now or so, I'm going to say. <laughs> um, you know, we kind of... There's obviously the regulatory aspect, and we got to meet all of the aspects. But we're also trying to think a little bit out of the box. I'm going to say, as far as where we can, where improvements can be made that are going to help the environment. I think we're trying to think outside of the box. So, from the restoration of the bogs, it's actually a, a ratio of 13 over 13 to one as far as the uh, wetland fill and the restoration uh, that's going to be done. So again, I think of you know significant environmental benefit. Um, I think, you know, LEC did say in their, in their closing paragraph in their letter, um, these mitigation measures will provide significant benefit to the wetland resource areas and protection of the interests of the state regulations and the bylaw rate regulations. So, you know, I, I know Drew and I have had a lot of discussion on that as well. And, you know, the approach that we're taking, we're, you know, wanting to address everything that we need to address and so that it's a it's a good project for everybody all the way around and I I I believe that I think and I don't want to speak for Drew but I think he believes that and I think that statement by LEC obviously we have some hoops to get through and hurdles to get over um, but I think that statement there 
you know, shows that kind of the strategy and the scope and the approach that we're using um, that we're going in the right direction. And that's really what we're trying to, as we've been moving this forward, we want to make sure that we're moving this forward in a fashion and manner that makes sense to the commission as well. We don't want to, we don't want to spend a lot of effort and, and, you know, dollars of the applicant going off in a direction that isn't going to, you know, make sense that the commission's not happy with, et cetera. So, you know, definitely want to hear, you know, comments and thoughts as we're moving through this process. We, you know, I fully expect this to be, you know, I, I would, I would, you know, estimate it's probably at least two more hearings because we'll need about, I want to go through this. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, request a continuance for a month. Um, I'm not sure what the, where the hearings are for, with the holidays and all, but you know probably yeah. to mid December if that's available, we'll yeah, work yeah. through this. I'd one hearing in December. Is one, uh, that's right. One because of the holidays. Yeah, is so. it December one? Or, is that full already, or, or you don't, you're not sure? Or, <laughs> so we. we yeah, it is. It, it is. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know. So we're looking at January 11th. There's no hearing scheduled yet for January 11th. January 11th. So that's what we'd be looking at. Okay, that'll yeah, give I us that'll so. give us time. <laughs> so, yeah. but you know, so we'll work with LEC. We'll work with Drew, and then even depending on you know, we're definitely going to be. Uh, I want to be sitting down with DEP, but I also want to do that where it's making sense. And we didn't want to go off on a direction with DEP without you know g direction and guidance from this commission. And you know, so we're trying to. Sure. Move it along together in a logical fashion as best we can. So, um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. But obviously, there's you know a lot of other information that we'll be pulling together and, and providing to the commission in response to LEC's uh, letter. Okay, thank you. Um, I got my copy as well today, and I marked it all up, but I haven't had a lot of time to absorb it. <laughs> right. but I've got it all highlighted. <laughs> Right. Um, and I know everything in here is preliminary, yep. and there's a lot of response that needs to be put into this so that they can give us a formal. Yeah, no, I understood. I'm just saying this for the benefit of the commissioners that might not have seen this today. Yep. Um, and I, I had a couple of minutes before tonight's hearing started to cross wires with Drew on this as well. So okay. We'll go through it all and uh, certainly work with you and as. You know, as we get closer to January 11th. Yeah, no, well, that's appreciated, and, and I think definitely. We'll have yeah. a much better handle on it. Absolutely. And I think, you know, just one other point I was going to make was I think when we were on site, uh, Drew and Brad Holmes and I, um, and we were talking about the habitat study for call, we knew that we, you know, that that was going to be a threshold aspect as well, but we had actually discussed, and Drew said, why don't you hold off on that until, you know, again, as these pieces come together so that we're addressing what we need to address and that we weren't going off in a direction that wasn't going to be necessary depending on revisions that may have happened. So just so that's understood, we, you know, we knew yeah. that there was some other elements that we were going to be addressing sure. down the road, so. Yeah. Okay, I have right. no further questions. Any questions or comments from commissioners? None? Okay, Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to continue the uh, notice of intent hearing for 275 Quinnacrossan Ave, Southworth Mashby Properties LLC to January 11th at what time? 6 p.m. 6, 6 p.m. So. Yep. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Thank you, Sam. Motion made and seconded for January 11th at 6 o'clock. Any further comments or discussion from commissioners? No? Steve? Oh. Yes. Aaron? Yes. Sandy? Yes. I vote yes as well. Thank so you very much. You have a are. great evening and happy Thanksgiving. I can't believe yep. that's in a week. <laughs> happy holidays. Take care. Come quick. Thank, Thank you. you Matt. Okay, 
I'm going to call the 609 hearing for 112 Waterline Drive South. Uh, Stefan and Tina Manarino. And this is a proposed construction of new garage with one bedroom apartment with a septic system upgrade to five bedrooms. The representative is Marsh Matters Environmental. Um, we do not have a DEP number. It's a notice of intent. The number is pending. And we don't have a representative here, but we have somebody online. The owner? Yes. Mr. Uh, Manorino, can you hear us? I mean, I think a continuous is in order anyway, just because there's no DEP number. Yeah, and he doesn't have an audio connection. Uh, he's not responding, so. Yeah. Mr. Manorino, can you hear us? Here, you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you just heard the opening of the hearing uh, from the chairman, but um, we weren't sure uh, if this hearing was going to be opened this evening because I had some correspondence with your consultant, um, Mike Ball, Marsh Matters, uh, about some information that was um, missing from the application and also uh, the DEP number, the Mass Department of Environmental Protection, they haven't issued a DEP permit number yet, which means they haven't completed their review of this application. and protocol is when we don't have a DEP number, the commission um, requires a continuance until that number is received. So um, I just wanted to give you kind of the breakdown there as far as procedure and protocols here. Um, I don't know if you were planning on, you know, proceeding tonight with a hearing, but the lack of a DEP number um, precludes the hearing from being opened this evening. Do you have any questions on that? Hello? Can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yeah, I, did you hear you? anything I, okay. I just said? Yeah, so I'm, I'm a little caught, I'm caught off guard because I, I wasn't informed of that information you just mentioned. Um, I thought my representative would be there tonight and we were proceeding, so I'm, I'm, I'm very surprised to hear that. Um, I'm very unfortunate. So what's the next meeting that I can that we can uh, continue. It's uh, January 11th at 6.03 p.m. Uh, okay. 6.03 p.m. Yeah, that would be the continuous time and a date and time. Okay, so the, the lack of having the, the, uh, the DEP number is what's holding it up this evening? That's, that's the main reason. There's also some um, regulatory compliance uh, or regulatory requirements um, that need to be met in this application that were not included in the uh, in what's been put together so far. And I, and I have informed uh, Mike Ball of those issues and he said he's going to, he understands and he's going to work uh, in uh, trying to uh, comply with that, uh, with that information, with those requirements. Okay. 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 Yeah, I, well, I, I, I didn't. I haven't been uh, informed of that, so I'll. Yeah. Uh, I'll check with him. It, it, it okay. appears that he to his job right now, so I'll, I'll address that. Okay. All right. Very good. Okay. Sorry. Sorry about the miscommunication there, but um, we'll we'll have it continue to January 11th. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. So I'd accept the motion for the continuance. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, make a motion for 112 Waterline Drive South. Uh, continue the notice of intent filing to January 11th at 6.03 p.m. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. Second? Second. Thank you, Sandy. Any questions from commissioners? No? I'll take a vote, Steve? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Sandy? Yes. I vote yes as well. Motion carries. So January 11th, 6.03. Okay. We'll open the 612 hearing for 18 Neshobi Road. 
Eli Lin proposed construction of a one-story addition to the existing house. The representative is the owner. This is a RDA. Hello. Good evening, sir. Yep, good you? evening. Uh, I'm Ilya Ilyin, and I'm owner of the house and uh, proposing the construction of this uh, addition. So uh, basically, it's uh, uh, the new addition to the house, but in place of the old sunroom and uh, the uh, porch. So there is a porch uh, in the front of the house and the sunroom just behind. Uh, the width of the structure is about uh, eight feet and uh, the addition will be constructed to extend that to 15 feet all the way to the driveway. And uh, this is um, an RDA uh, request. Uh, the construction uh, or the reason for the request is that um, currently this corner of uh, the house where uh, the building is proposed is in the flooding zone. So it's not the entire lot, but just uh, that corner. And um, uh, this is uh, basically will be constructed on a post foundation. So it's not uh, any kind of bell foundation. It's going to be uh, several posts. And uh, it will be hanging the same way as uh, the sunroom now located. So uh, it goes all the way to the uh, edge of this uh, existing deck, which you, you can see on the back of the house. So it will be flashed with that uh, deck. Uh, and a little bit uh, wider than the current uh, sunroom and the front porch, as I mentioned, uh, for five feet uh, wider. Okay. Yep, that's, if you have any questions, I would be glad to answer. Uh, I think I'll start. Uh, with a couple of questions. The deck itself, the existing deck that's on the rear of the building, is that coming off as well, or is that- No, it stays. Stay, that's gonna stay in yep. place. So this addition just abuts up to that deck and comes out- to Up to the side of the deck, yes. It will be flash with the deck. Um, and what about the large tree that's Right there. I mean, it's the, the one on the right of the house. This yeah. one right here. Yeah, so yeah. this tree uh, either should go or uh, be trimmed. Uh, we had an inspection from the insurance company, so it's overgrow the house now uh, and hanging over the roof. So they actually uh, asked to remove the tree. And I'm kind of debating if I need to remove it or not because this is a cherry tree and all the roots actually went underneath of the house and the deck. So maybe it should be. Uh, gone. Uh, the uh, shrubs around, they will be moved around just to uh, allow the space for the construction. We're trying to kind of keep all the vegetation around and maybe move it a little bit front and back to be able to so preserve it. Existing shrubs will be taken out and relocated. And relocated to, to the front of the house. Uh, it looks like this is what we want to do, yeah. And you want to try to save that tree? Yeah. That's all I had for questions. I have no questions. Aaron, any questions? No. Sandy? No. Uh, questions from people that are here in the audience? No? Drew, any comments or questions? Um, I think so. Just to, unless the commissioners have any questions about my comments, um, and that it was already stated by the applicant that. Uh, only a very small portion of this is actually within the, the land subject to coastal storm flow. The majority of work is outside of the flood zone. Um, so it's kind of like the elevation kind of surrounding the house changes. Uh, okay. But most of the work is outside the flood zone. So. Other than that, no, uh, no, other, no other comments from there. Okay, thank you. For Port of Health, sorry, I'll, I'll just read those comments for the record. Uh, proposed family room addition on sonar tubes is not considered an increase in flow and does not require a Title V inspection. Floor plans to be reviewed upon submission to the building department. Setbacks from tank and soil absorption system must be maintained or a variance requested. Note the location of septic system and restrict equipment and vehicle traffic over non-loading H10 components. <coughs> ZBA hearing is scheduled for January 16th. And that's it. No other comments? Other agencies? 
requirements. Thank you. Would you accept the motion? Uh, yeah, Mr. Chairman, make a motion for 18 Shelby Road, uh, uh, RDA application for a negative determination with the condition of uh, roof runoff capture to uh, dry wells. Okay, thank you, Steve. Second. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Aaron. Motion made and seconded. Any discussion amongst commissioners? Good. Okay. Roll call vote, Steve? Yes. Eric? Yes. Sandy? Yes. I vote yes as well. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good thing to you. Thank you. Thank you, you as well. Call the 615 hearing for 42 Wheeler Road, Marcio de Jesus, proposed raise and replace of the single family dwelling with associated landscaping and hardscaping. Representative is Cauley Site Services, LLC. This is continued from 9 7, 9 21, and 11 2. It's a notice of intent, DEP file number 433252. Good evening. Good evening, gentlemen. All right. I'm William Cauley of Cauley Site Services, and this is Cameron Larson of Environmental Consulting and Restoration. Um, I'm representing Marcio De Jesus on 42 Wheeler Road for a raise and rebuild of a three bedroom home. Um, we had issues the last time we were in here, and I think we have them resolved. Uh, the, first one was the removal of the bocce court and add more mitigation planning. We added two to one to, um, as for the bocce court. It's been removed, or it's going to be removed. The next was erosion control uh, for the driveway. We added in uh, <clears throat> Gravel cave to detail showing from the top of the driveway down to uh, just beyond the tennis court. Also, uh, we showed that um, to install a leaching basin and also a swale down at, uh, towards the end of the driveway. The driveway will be during construction, it will be pitched off to that side to take any uh, sediment or anything that would run down to the pond. Also, we added in dry wells for runoff for the roof. Um, we requested a variance from the Board of Health as far as the septic system. It was denied, so uh, another system was designed denitrification septic system to go in. Also, uh, to identify and depict on the plan the top of the inland fresh water bank and the uh, ordinary high uh, water elevation. There was also the issue of um, the Natural Heritage Endangered Species Program. We did get a reply, uh, I believe you have it, that it shows it will not adversely affect the habitat and uh, <coughs> it meets the standard for issuance of an order of conditions. Um, what else? Okay, and we also, uh, we are retaining an arborist to determine the impact on the roots of the red maple out front. Okay. Anything else? All set? Yeah. Okay. Questions from commissioners? Um, Mr. Chairman, it looks like um, all our concerns have, have been met uh, based on our last 
meeting request yep. for this project. Uh, house is moving back away from the pond. Um, I had concern about groundwater, but they provided uh, with the monitoring well, groundwater as of uh, a week ago is 42.39. Top of the foundation is probably 46, so four foot height. So, you know, I had concern about going down with a four foot frost wall where they would hit groundwater. Right. You know, maybe this time of year, no, but you know, another time of year they might. But, uh, but it seems like there's enough wiggle room there for that. Um, um, the groundwater elevation was 44 inches below the ground. right. You're not playing having a full basement underneath that house? No, no. no. Just a crawl space? Uh, the way I believe it's going to be a crawl space with a dust cap in there. Okay. Or a moisture, you know, for okay. moisture. <laughs> yeah, that's a concern. If you're going down too deep, you take groundwater. But uh, other than that, I'm, I'm satisfied with uh, all the changes. Yep. Yeah. I know you were concerned about that swale for the driveway. With yeah. The, yeah, that worked out, yeah, that's a steep driveway, so yeah. that, that worked out good. Aaron, any questions that you have? Sandy? Good. And did you say you were, you were going to have an arborist take a look at that tree? Yes, ECR will uh, take a look at that. And did you get any um, any time frame on that at all? Or um, I'll have to talk to Brad. Yeah, so ECR has a certified arborist on staff. We can, you know, happy to take a look at... Uh, at the tree at the root zone. I think there were concerns around the proposed deck that work around there, so we can certainly be available for when that work happens. Okay. <clears throat> Great. So would you uh, just contact the office when that appointment is set up so that we're aware of, you know, that being looked at? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, I have no further questions. Um, anyone in the audience that has a question or comment? Hearing none, Drew, is there anything you would like to? Uh, uh, let's see. <coughs> there are nothing really more to add on other than just a condition for the submission of a, a, a signed three year mitigation <laughs> monitoring and maintenance contract with a qualified professional. And I do have a recommendation that some of the plantings that are proposed, particularly pasture rose and witch hazel, be replaced with clethra and bayberry uh, or eggberry for those. Um, my experience with pasture rose and Virginia rose is it can become kind of a nuisance spreading. It's a, it's a native, I understand that, but it, if it's planted in close proximity to other types of plantings, it has a tendency to kind of take over. So I'd rather see that swapped out with clethra, which should do fine there, um, and either bayberry or inkberry for uh, witch hazel, which isn't particularly common uh, in this area, so I think that may work better in chance of kind of surviving and thriving in that area. So, Board of Health comments, uh, raise and replace of existing dwelling triggers the need for full compliance with Board of Health IA septic system regulations, floor plans to be reviewed upon submission to the building department, rodent inspection required with abatement if necessary, Building Department comments, project seeking ZBA approval scheduled for uh, December 13th, 2023. No other comments. Thank you. Okay, unless there's any further questions from commissioners, I accept the motion. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I make a motion for 42 Wheeler Road, Marcio de Jesus for an attempt filing for a closing issue. Um, with the condition of a uh, signed three year mitigation monitoring contract with a qualified professional and um, changing the proposed mitigation plantings to Clethora and Bayberry. Thank you, Steve. Is there a second for that? Second. Thank you, Sandy. Any discussion on the motion that we have? Hearing none, I'll take a roll call vote. Steve? Yes. Thank you. Aaron? Yes. Sandy? Yes. Thank you. I vote yes as well. Motion carries. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Have a good night.
Yeah, I caught the tail end of that. So yeah, that's that's fine. <coughs> yeah. Sure. Sure. I believe I do. Um, let, me, let me get it started and go from there. Okay, I'm going to call the 618 hearing for 190 Monomaskoy Road. Kevin Kayer proposed construction and maintenance of a two story, three bedroom, single family dwelling, deck, Title V sewage disposal system with a fast denitrification and UV treatment. Dry wells, driveway, retaining wall, all associated utilities, excavation, grading, and landscaping, mitigation buffer plantings, and maintenance of a path to water. Representative is Cape and Islands Engineering. This is a notice of intent, DEP file number 433258. Good evening. Good evening. For the record, Raul Isardi from Cape and Islands Engineering, representing the applicant, uh, Mr. Kayer, for this project. Um, a little bit of history, which I believe the only one in front of me that may recognize this project is Drew. But this project has had um, approvals in the past. Um, there is going to be a Zoning Board of Appeals hearing for this project, um, scheduled, I believe, in two weeks. So the project is for um, is a building, a single family um, dwelling in a vacant lot. Um, the project has had permits from, I believe, 2018, um, even permits from 2008. Um, the owner was not able to completely um, go through the construction for the last permits that he received. Um, the permits that he received in 2008 were complicated by COVID. His business suffered some um, setbacks during that period. Um, subsequently, um, there was family matters that he had to take care of. Um, so the project, all that took effect was the limit of work was installed. The area inside the limit of work was cleared. But then, at that point, everything stopped. Um, there were two different orders of conditions um, open during that time. One was for the house and the septic system and all associated um, improvements with the house. A separate one was following the initial attempts from 2008 for a platform to access the 10A flow. The 10A flow on the site um, was issued a permit through the Harvard Master. Um, think of it as a mooring. Um, so in 2008, there was an attempt to do a platform for a ramp to access that flow. It was revisited in 2018, and it was permitted through this board. Both of those permits had expired. Um, so a request to close those permits was filed um, with this department um, because of this new notice of intent. Since those permits expired, we are applying a new notice of intent practically for the same um, project that was approved. What we did notice when we visited the site is that a portion of the limit of work that is on the ground today exceeds what was approved from that permit. On the plan, it is a piece of triangle that adds up to about 100 square feet. Um, so what we're calling for this application is that 100 square foot to be restored, that limit of work to be 
relocated to what was approved um, back in 2018. Um, and then that 100 square feet to be <coughs> replanted with the same species list that we had proposed back in 2018 and approved. So the resources um, on this project are the entire property is in the land subject to coastal stone flourish. There is a coastal bank. Um, there is a fringe of a BBW, and then there's salt marsh. Um, and then there's Great River, which is land under the ocean. This is a um, tidal water body. Um, and there is mean low water, mean high water. Um, the proposed restoration with native planting species is the same that was proposed and approved in 2018, where we did notice comparing the edge of natural vegetation today from what was in 2018, nature has grown into what used to be some cleared areas. So there is less planting to do. We're not going to remove what's naturally growing to plant something else. So the area that's called out to be restored um, is slightly smaller in footprint, but not because we're proposing less. It's just because naturally the area has been uh, revegetating itself naturally. Um, the septic system is uh, enhanced um, nitrogen removal and a UV um, septic system, um, same location that's been approved um, in the past. Um, what we are proposing is a fringe of 20, no less than 35 feet measure from the BBW um, of natural vegetated areas. So this upland um, land that is from the BBW to the little bit of work is at, at least 35 feet. Um, in terms of square footage, that adds up to more than 50% of the upland area of the site. Um, the limit of work itself, the enclosure, is roughly 4,000 square feet. The land, land work and upland from the BBW is roughly 10,338 square feet. Um, so more than half of that is going to be preserved as naturally vegetated buffer zone with the addition of the restoration, including that restoration. There was an old path that was approved through an RDA. That path will no longer be needed with the new path that is being proposed. So that is part of the planted area that's going to become naturally vegetated. Um, the, set that, the setbacks to the resources that were um, approved before are the same for this building, um, 26 feet to the coastal bank, 38 feet to the BBW, 41 feet to the salt marsh, um, and then the limb of work is still at 35 feet from the BBW. Um, for the platform, it is slightly different location than what it was proposed originally. Back in 2008, the platform was actually proposed in the salt marsh. In 2018, we moved it away from the salt marsh. It was one of the posts was still in the BBW. Through that process and that permit that was granted, one of the comments and the conditions was that the ramp that went from that platform to the, the float needed to provide the five foot clearance for lateral access, um, public access. <laughs> so this platform is slightly higher than what was shown on the approved plan from 2008 to take into account that special condition. And that is for the whole purpose that the, the ramp, when the float is at mean low, people can actually, there's five feet clearings underneath that ramp. Um, so that, that's the project um, in a whole. We do have proposed drywalls um, for roof runoff, um, but essentially we're just asking for a reissuance of a order of condition to replace the one that expired. If there's any questions, um, I'll try to answer. Thank you. Open it up to commissioners that may have questions or comments first. I had a whole bunch of questions, but I think Drew's comments should probably be read first because it covers everything. I don't, see, you know, that asking questions if based on his comments be, you know, kind of pointless at the moment. I have a couple of letters from. Uh, um, do you guys agree with that? Instead of just, uh, 
let me uh, let me read into the record. I have two different letters that uh, have been sent in to be read into the record. So I'll get those done first, and we can go from there. Do you have? You got? It. Yeah. The first letter is from uh, Wayne and Susan Simmons, 105 Montemascoy West Road, Mashpee, Mass. To the Conservation Commission, I am writing to express our strong opposition to the application of Kevin Kayer to build on 190 Montemascoy Road. He has requested to build there before and was denied for many important reasons, including being too close to the marsh. He will need too many variances to make this acceptable. It will also set a very bad precedent for Montemascoy Island which is already suffering the negative effects of overbuilding. We are always hearing about the 100 or 150 foot bylaw, so it seems absurd to approve this application. Mr. Kayer bought an unbuildable lot and should not expect the town to make it buildable. I also wish the town would prevent people from removing all the trees on a lot before it is approved for building. Thank you for your consideration, Wayne and Susan Simmons. There's a second letter that has been requested to be read into the record. This is from Don Barton, Monomascoy Road. This project poses a risk with new development and intrusion with inadequate setbacks. The small lot, the cleared construction site, and the proposed Title V septic system slash leaching fields are situated in close proximity to undisturbed marsh and wetlands. There is the issue of drainage runoff stemming from the footprint of the proposed three bedroom residence and parking space. This proposal again seems to be in conflict with all of the town's recent discussions and resolve on buffer zones. The subsurface water table is notably rising on the island from climate change factors. With more tidal flooding, the bottom of the dry wells must still be located at least three feet above the seasonally high water table. The rising water table will likely interfere with the function of the dry wells on this low-lying parcel. Another reality is that the waters in the upper stretch of Great River are already posted for contamination. The waters are becoming deplorable and the decline can only intensify. There is no margin for more nitrogen contamination. The tidal exchange in this location is very limited. The system resident time per the MEP report for a molecule of water to transit out of Wakoit Bay is 21 days. At this juncture, adding more septic system contamination and environmental pressures are difficult to accept, especially on marginal lots in these sensitive areas. The contamination signs are now posted in the waters at House 202 Montemascoy Road and also across at the entrance to Jehu Pond. The brackish nitrogen-laced waters are now tainted brown in the spring with no shell fishing permitted. Marine life is being suffocated. Water temperatures are soaring. Warnings were issued this past summer for possible vibrio infection from swimming and immersion in the waters of the upper Great River. The recorded water quality metrics are plummeting from the Title V system discharges. The degraded status of the waterways and the untold cleanup expense can lead to only one conviction. It is that the direct introduction to the water's edge of new sources of nitrogen contamination should not be sanctioned. Approval of this application can no longer be in the interest of the common good. Owners should consider building when sewer services become available. Further, no amount of mitigating new planting offerings will offset the release of more nitrogen. Thank you, Don Barton, Montemascoy Road. So those are the two letters that were submitted. Um, 
through? Do you want to make your comments, or do you want to have commissioners uh, ask questions? Um, I mean, the commissioners have my comments in front of them, so I think yeah. we'll go to commissioners for comments. Okay. We can certainly follow up if necessary. Sure. Okay. Um, any questions, Aaron? Um, just that it seems that it's against it's, it's against the new bylaw. That it's not a buildable lot. If I'm understanding it correctly, it's seventy-five. Well, my initial reaction when I saw the, the plans is that they don't reflect the new 75-foot um, vegetated buffer strip, nor do they reflect the 150-foot uh, buffer zone. Uh, and I know the uh, project was filed. I know the, the cover letter to me was October 24th. Uh, you know, this past in the Maytown meeting, the Attorney General weighed in on it back, I think it was September 25, and then we set a date of October 20th uh, to have any submissions that come in October 20th or thereafter to reflect all of the new uh, buffer zone setbacks and, and uh, numbers. So that said, when I look at the map, I, I don't see that. Um, one of the questions that I have, it, it's, not, it's not a question, it's a comment. And I know we saw a similar situation on Montemiscoy Island. When I look at the soil evaluator's logs, um, and it goes through all the various horizons, A, B, C, and so forth, uh, when you get down to uh, the data that's being used, it says that the adjusted high groundwater elevation of 0 0.2 feet, and AVD 88, obtained from a monitoring well at 51 Montemiscoy Road West. Observations by David Sinicki, witnessed by Eliza McQuaid, date tested April 1st, 1999. Uh, so I find it very difficult as a commissioner, especially in light of the fact of everything that we're dealing with, with nitrogen and our estuaries and bays, to look at data that's being submitted from 1999 and be able to assess the validity of clearance from you know, the diffusion chambers of this proposed system from groundwater. And West Montemiscoy is the other side of the island. We're on the Jehu Pond side of the island. And I know the elevations, I think the highest elevation on this lot is eight, I believe it's contour eight. <coughs> Close to the yeah. road, yeah, you're right. Which is where the system is going. Uh, so, I'm. I just find it very difficult to be able to make a logical decision on this particular system. Uh, I'm also going to come back to what I've spoken time and time and time again. Regulation 25, the setbacks in Regulation 25 specifically address new residential buildings and garages and new septic systems being placed in land subject to coastal flow. And uh, I know there's been some disagreement on the commission about that, but I, I stand fast on Regulation 25. And I wouldn't be able to approve this project. Sandy, any questions or comments? No, I agree with you. Yeah, the other question I had is about mentioning, you know, the land subject to coastal storm flow, which is considered wetland. and there's the whole property is underneath that, so there's no upland. And there's no upland, no. Right, so uh, you know, there's, just, there's no upland there at all, so. And then, yeah, it goes against Regulation 25, <laughs> you know, for, you know, the buffer zones and setbacks and things like, yeah, I, I can't support this project either. There, there are others as well, but you know, those come to mind right away. Um, Well, would you like to say something? So yeah, um, a couple of corrections. Um, first, from the first letter that was read to the record, stating that this is a non-buildable lot. Um, this already went through that process with CBA um, several years ago. This is a vacant lot. It was legally subdivided as a buildable lot. It predates those regulations uh, or those zoning um, establishments of today. Um, and it was found that it, this is, in fact, a buildable lot. Um, the, the setbacks in questions, um, if we apply truly those setbacks, then that will be a forced 
regulatory taking of the property, which has been paying taxes as a buildable lot for many, many years. Um, but the question also on the groundwater or the soil logs. That soil log was witnessed, was performed according to Title V. If this board disagrees with how that information is being presented, this is a matter with um, the health department. Um, they review that information. That information has been approved. Um, so there's no reason to change that. The septic system that's being proposed is an enhanced nitrogen reducing septic system that is what we've been promoting for. In addition to that, knowing that we don't meet the 50 foot setbacks to the wetlands, um, we are providing the UV treatment system. Um, the setbacks to the other resources, it is the same setbacks that was um, shown before. Um, a three foot separation for dry wells, this is the first time I hear such a comment on any project. Um, for residential projects, um, the mass DEP stormwater management standards is not applicable. For commercial projects, the minimum separation is two feet from the high water table for leaching system for drainage purpose. So I don't know where the comments from three feet on that second letter um, come, but it was stated. I understand somebody just made that statement. It was just read. But I just wanted to clarify that. Um, on similar projects, yes, there is the case where um, if a, a leaching pit which is about two feet deep, but it's also one foot below grade, so it puts it about three feet below grade. We switch that over to trenches, which are shallower. Um, serves the same purpose, but it doesn't go that deep into the ground. Um, that is a simple um, alternative that we can do at this location for the two drywalls on the back. The drywalls in the front um, and near the, um, actually the, the one to the south of the, of the house is the one roughly at elevations of some eight or sevens, so that could easily be a dry well um, and provide separation to groundwater. Um, but the comments that, that I'm hearing from this board that based on the regulations um, from this board that this lot is suddenly unbuildable, I will have to ask for a continuance if that is the opinion of this board so that my client can engage with an attorney um, to actually um, provide information uh, of, to that case, because this will be a regulatory taking if the regulations here suddenly deem this lot unbuildable. I think what you're actually doing is you're blending a letter from the public with an opinion of this commission. And I think that's a dangerous place to go. Nobody in this commission has mentioned that this lot is unbuildable at this particular stage of the hearing. So I, so, did, I thought I let heard. Me continue. You gotta let him finish, Raul. Yeah. Let me continue. You have made mention of regulatory taking more than once. There is no such thing as a regulatory take. If this board were to deny this particular project, you would have every opportunity to ask for a superseding order of conditions from the DEP. If they denied that superseding order, you still would not have a regulatory take because you, as a representative of your applicant, could then go to the commissioner of the DEP and ask for a waiver. So there is no such thing as a regulatory take unless the commissioner of the DEP failed to grant that waiver. Then you would be out of luck. And that would really fall on the state, not the local jurisdiction. So I, I take exception to you claiming in this hearing that this is a regulatory take of some kind when the, the commission hasn't even voted. So I, I think you're a little bit out of line with that, that statement. I apologize. I stand correctly, but I thought I, I, thought I heard the term that it was unbuildable. You did. That was in the letter from no, the No, but I thought I heard it from commissioners as well. But if, that, if, if I misheard, I apologize. Yeah. But if, and if that's the case, I will still want to ask for a continuance because I need to advise my client of the opinion that I just heard so that he can prepare himself for that next step. Um, and if that next step will be through the state, 
then, then yeah, that he needs to be aware of it. That's okay, I'm going to uh, go to you for the next. Sure. So um, my comments really center around the fact that this application has come in after uh, the change in the bylaw uh, to expand the buffer zone to 150 feet, setting a minimum standard for a naturally vegetated buffer strip uh, on an undeveloped lot at 75 feet. Um, in your project narrative, there is no request for a waiver of standards. There is no request for uh, an ease of any of the regulatory standards. Uh, you're just proposing as is. So I find that a bit surprising that there is no request for a waiver or you know any sort of branching of relief. Um, I would have expected something like that given the constraints uh, on this lot. But that being the case, um, it is just logically assumed that you're uh, you're not asking for a waiver, and so you're coming in with a proposal that doesn't meet uh, this regulatory standard now of a 75-foot um, minimum naturally vegetated buffer strip. So from that standpoint alone, I recommend that the commission issue a denial with prejudice, um, as I do not believe that um, there's any sort of proposal that can meet that standard. Um, of that 75 foot and in the absence of a waiver that just goes to further kind of cement that viewpoint um, that opinion <clears throat> so I don't think a continuance is in order I think the Commission should move forward with a decision on this and as the chairman just described you do have an avenue at your disposal to pursue an appeal if you like but I don't feel a continuance is necessary um, just based on this uh, on the, on the regulations to change in the uh, bylaw to a minimum of a 75 foot wide um, naturally vegetated buffer strip that simply cannot be achieved on this lot. Um, furthermore, you know, there are a lot of significant disturbances within 50 feet uh, of a lot of these resource areas. And I just feel that overall, this is going to have a significant um, adverse impact on these resource areas for a variety of reasons. Uh, the fact that there was additional clearing done on this lot uh, as it was being uh, prepared for development um, is another issue that will need to be addressed regardless of the outcome of the decision of this uh, proposal, that that's going to need to be addressed uh, as well because you step onto the site uh, and you look at GIS photos, you know, back before the previous order of conditions was issued, and there's a substantial amount of clearing, um, and so that's that's going to that's an issue that, that's going to need to be addressed moving forward. So I don't think a continuance is in order. I think the commission should move forward with a uh, a decision. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments from commissioners? Let me go out to the uh, people in the audience. Questions or comments on this? Project proposal? Nobody? Uh, we don't have anybody online? No, there's nobody here. So. Okay. So I would, um, I'm open to a motion. Okay, Mr. Chairman, make a motion for uh, no some temp filing for 190 Monum Square Road for a, a denial with prejudice due to. Um, this uh, project not meeting requirements of Chapter 172 and Regulation 25. Is there a second to that motion? A second. Thank you, Cindy. Any discussion amongst commissioners on the motion that we have? None? Take a roll call vote, Steve. Um, it would be yes, but right, but denial. Yep. Aaron? Yes. Sandy? Yes. I vote yes as well. Motion does not carry. Or the motion carries. Sorry. Yeah. Project doesn't carry. Hard 
Okay. Um. We have um, several orders of, excuse me, several certificate of compliance requests, um, all of which, well, I should take that back, some of which passed. Um, 33 stages, Sturgis Lane has passed. Um, 40 Bayview Road has passed. Uh, 220 Waiting Place Road. There are actually two different uh, certificates, 43-3159 and 43-3160. Those have all passed, so I don't see any need to discuss those. However, um, the certificate of compliance request for 40 Polaris Drive, Roy V. Um, Fagerberg, request for the certificate for compliance uh, DEP number 431457, um, that inspection failed, and I'll turn it over to Drew to fill you, commissioners, in on the rationale for the failure of that request. So, um, just to clarify, it, it didn't necessarily fail inspection because it was a septic system upgrade that took place many, many years ago. So, for the intent of the COC inspection, this it, it did not fail uh, inspection in regards to the subject. Uh, project. Uh, what happened was, and this has been my kind of, you know, protocol whenever I go on to a site, whether it's for, you know, a forthcoming permit, COC, uh, notice of intent, whatever the case may be, if there's an issue that constitutes a violation, then I, I consider that kind of, uh, for COC to be put on hold, basically, until that violation is complied with. So what happened in this particular property is that there was a uh, picket fence that was constructed around the backyard, a perimeter fence, um, and roughly uh, the, the resource area for this is an isolated freshwater vegetated wetland. Um, the fence is approximately, I didn't get out and measure because it was just way too thick vegetation to get out there and, and do any measurement, but it, based on the plan that accompanied the certificate of compliance, it's, it's right at about the 50 foot setback. So they did some clearing about maybe five to six feet on average behind the fence, assuming to allow for um, access for the construction of the fence. The fence looks relatively new. I'm guessing it was done within the last month or so. Um, but we don't have any um, permitting on record for the fence. Um, I don't consider the fence to be you know, something that couldn't be permitted. Um, so my recommendation is to uh, inform the applicants that um, you know this is jurisdictional and they need to come forward with an after the fact permit to uh, get authorization to, you know to have the commission review the fence um, and also to uh, address the, the clearing that was done this still debris back there all the cut debris was kind of left back there um, so that needs to be first of all cleaned up and then uh, mitigated for but my question in talking to Paul earlier and reviewing the situation was um, procedurally what type of permit would be acceptable to the commission for this situation because you know one of the aspects of this is that they are going to be required to do mitigation um, which would be a you know essentially a condition of the permit and I know that the commission doesn't like to get into the habit of conditioning RDAs but on this flip side Requiring notice of intent for a perimeter fence is a little excessive, uh, paperwork-wise. Um, so, my recommendation, my thoughts are that uh, you could have them fill out, you know, an RDA and be after the fact, and after the fact charges would apply, um, and then we would handle the planting through a violation, you know, uh, protocol, like like any other violation would kind of be handled separately, um, but. The COC should not be issued. It doesn't even really have to be signed. It shouldn't be signed or issued uh, until you know one of two things happens. And again, this is your decision, your discretion. Either we receive the application, and then the COC could be released upon receipt of the application, or if the commission feels that you want to go through the review process first after the receipt of the application gets scheduled for a hearing, and you render a decision, and then the COC gets released. It's, Entirely up to you. It makes no difference to me whichever way you feel you want to proceed with this, but um, I'm, you know, letting you decide on that, yeah. whichever way you want to proceed. But. Okay. So I'll open okay. this up to discussion. I'm in favor of the latter. 
said, so let's do the IDA, get that approved, and we'll then both go out the, at the same time. Then everything's covered. I mean, there's Hold no the COC until yeah, until the, the IDA, yeah, and then then you know the IDA's got one to move forward with, and the COC is done. I just, yeah. Yeah. Andy, feel the same way. Aaron, one question I had on the fence itself: Do we have enough clearance under that fence right. for uh, wildlife? Yeah, so they would need to create clearance because it's pretty much flush with the ground, and it is an enclosed perimeter fence around the back of the house. Um, so there is no passage opportunity for wildlife to pass through that area. Mm -hmm. um, so I am recommending that the fence ends could easily be done. They could just cut at the bottom a six inch clearance. Uh, doesn't even have to be across the, the entire. Huh? Off the pickets themselves? Off the pickets themselves at, at the ground level. Doesn't yeah. even have to be all around it, just as long as there's some reasonable passageway for animals. Um, you know, so it doesn't uh, restrict uh, movement in terms of wildlife. Um, that is the protocol that we have for fences in general. Sure. So um, I think that could be easily accommodated. Yeah. So once it gets filed as an RDA, we can go out on the site, take a look at it, and determine how much of a wildlife card do we want to make right. on the way to that fence. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. OK. Um, we need to vote on that, no, no, no vote is necessary. Just wanted to get your, uh, your opinion. So that's why. So we'll we'll have them submit the paperwork, go through the hearing, decision rendered, then CLC uh, after that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Sounds good. All right. So I'm going to back us up to uh, the beginning. Sorry, at the beginning of the hearing. <laughs> um, we we don't have minutes to approve. Correct? We do not. Uh, yeah. Uh, and. <clears throat> Again, I want to publicly thank Nicole for coming in. That was uh, quite a presentation. That's great. Um, and that really tied in with our nasty water quality issues. Uh, we also have to look at the, uh, the CPC application for the land acquisition Correct. of uh, the Pickle Cove for a letter of support. Uh, we held off on doing this for more information. And I know everybody has received uh, Bruce environmental assessment of the property. I was reviewing that again today. 70 degrees, no wind. Those days are gone. <laughs> but uh, it was a great report. Thank you. And I looked at all of the parcels. Uh, I don't want to get into financial pieces. I don't think that's necessary for us as a commission to either support or not support this project. Um, I think. I would like to say that all 17 acres are just going to be applied for and, and hopefully purchased, but in reading it, it doesn't look that way. It's a part of it now, it part and of it, yeah. maybe another part of it later. And right. What I think is the most crucial piece right down on the shoreline, mm -hmm. there was no decision on that one way or the other. Yeah, and that, and, but it can't be built anyway, so right. even if we don't get it, it's right. essentially going to be remaining as yeah. open space. So, um, unless there's any other questions uh, that you want to bring up or discuss on the information that's been provided to us, I would entertain a motion for a uh, letter of support uh, to the CPC on this application. Okay. Make it so moved. Thank you, Skip. Yep. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Sandy. Any further discussion? No? Okay, I'll take a vote. Steve? Yes. Thank you. Aaron? Yes. Thank you. Sandy? Yes. And I vote yes as well. So we can, we can put that together and... Do you want me to draft the letter and, or do you want to draft? It doesn't matter to me. Why don't you draft it up, yeah. uh, shoot it over to me when you have it. Sure. Uh, we'll get that into the packet because I know planning has already put theirs in, the friends have theirs in, uh, Brenda, yep. a few others. Okay. Um, one of the I guess I should have brought this up in discussion. Uh, is there any financial commitment from the, the groups that have uh, supported this, uh, the friends or Randa? I know there's a conservation restriction that would go onto the lot. Right, who, there would who be. Who yeah. shoulders that burden? Um, it may be, actually, no, it was, there was discussion that it might have been the Native Land Conservancy, but there, uh, there was some issues uh, with the landowners as far as them being the holders of the CR. I don't know what the reasons were. It's just what I was told from Evan. Um, so we can look at other entities. 
And if there isn't, then we would? Then we would, yeah. Which is fine. We, we, we have, there are some existing parcels where we are the holders of the CR uh, already. So, um, yeah, but we can, we can reach out to the land, tr uh, land trust and see if there's any interest. Um, I don't think trustees usually gets involved with parcels, smaller parcels, but I don't know. We can, yeah, um, I, I don't know where they're at right now, but uh, yeah. I can say that I know the partners group has so many nonprofits in it that do CRs that we have options to yeah. pick from. And I, okay. yeah. I know one of them would definitely step up if they do. Yeah. Okay. And then Mark Robinson with the Compact and Conservation Trust, he's the guy that, uh, that we've always relied on to um, pay for his services to draft up the conservation restrictions yep. and kind of handle all the legwork where that's concerned. Sure. So he yeah. always does a great job with that. So. And I know there's another application before CPC for open space planning, correct? I believe so, yeah. Because our open space plan needs to be updated. Oh, yeah, open space oh, plan. Open space yeah, yeah. So, yes. Yes. so that we could start yes. looking for... Yeah, we really need, to, really need to get that done. Yeah. That's a huge priority. Yeah. Okay, very good. Um, we also have the New England Mountain Bike Association proposal to create two natural surface trails in the western area of Manhattan. packet, and they are here tonight. Yes. Um, Sorry for making you wait all this time. But that's all right. Uh, you know all about our jellyfish. There's uh, some really interesting topics earlier on. It's very fascinating. Um, so for the record, I'm Lev Malakoff. I'm a vice president with the... Ch Cape Cod chapter of New England Mountain Bike Association, and I have with me Dave Lafreniere, who is the other vice president. We have multiple vice presidents. Yeah. Well, we, Always we, a good thing. we we do a lot, and we have a, uh, get a lot done. So, um, uh, just for your uh, folks at home, um, we were about a 200-member uh, club here on Cape Cod. Uh, our overall organization has about um, 10,000 members or so, and 34 chapters throughout New England. Um, we are uh, we are for having um, a good experience out on our trails uh, that um, we don't own any of them, but we um, certainly see them as an important resource for the communities and and we try to um, help enhance that experience for others by uh, maintaining and creating trails that we are here to discuss uh, tonight. Um, so we do have a uh, a, a couple uh, images up on your uh, on your screens there, showing what we're proposing doing. Um, on the west side of the Mashpee River Woodlands area, there's a few little pieces of trails out there that are kind of either dead ends or um, uh, you know which create kind of a, tra a traffic issue sometimes when everyone's going one way and they want to go the other way. Uh, so you know I I've, I've been very familiar with this area. I've been uh, visiting it as a walker and a biker for for several years, and I and I realized, you know, wouldn't it be uh, a, a wonderful thing to have a, a looped connector trail uh, in, in these areas? Uh, so there, there's actually two proposals here. Um, the one on the north, uh, the top of the the image, is in the Grotsky Grove vicinity, um, and. There is an existing dead end trail that goes out to a, a nice scenic uh, overlook, kind of looking over the marsh. Um, and the uh, the proposed connector would be about 650 feet long. It'd be to the southwest of the existing trail. Um, and uh, the scenery there is just amazing. I think uh, that, that folks would really enjoy uh, walking or riding out on that section. Uh, the bottom segment is a bit longer. It's about a mile long uh, on the um, John Austin Forest parcel. Um, there's an existing trail. It's kind of hard to see, um, but there's an existing trail to the east. Uh, this uh, it kind of the, the, the goals would be kind of the same. It would create an opportunity for a loop experience for folks to um, travel around that parcel uh, on one trail and come back on another. Um, and uh, uh, just so you so you're aware of how how these things would get implemented, uh, assuming that we have an approval, uh, we would work with the uh, conservation agents to schedule the workday. Our uh, organization has its own insurance policy. Uh, we have provided that before. We can give you an updated 
the current year version. So um, you would uh, uh, have uh, hopefully any liability concerns addressed there. Um, the work involves basically trimming. We don't intend to take down any trees, uh, possibly a, a two inch sapling at the, in, in some rare uh, uh, occurrences, because um, we really don't care for straight trails. We like to meander and, and experience the, the landscape. Um, and so once the uh, any deadfall logs that had fallen across the, the route, those would be uh, trimmed out so that then a, a mower could go through. It's basically a, a, a yard mower, and Dave can explain a little bit more, but it's a, a little more sturdy, but it's a, you know, whatever, a 36 inch deck. So um, the trail surface would be prepared about um, four feet wide just because the brush starts growing in. And then, um, uh, It'd be ready for ready for you folks to use. Um, I did put a couple pictures in the flash key. I don't know if those could be pulled up as well. Um, Looks like who, I can get that on. Some of you might recall me uh, presenting um, a year or two ago. Uh, we did do uh, a trail connection on the east side of Mashpee River Woodlands, creating that loop system. Uh, the Great Pine Trail, mm -hmm. if any of you have been out in the, in the parcel, we have um, installed a couple signposts there to help guide folks. Um, and so, um, I'm not sure if that's the, the right file. Is that not the right Oh, file? that's the right, uh, uh, go to the uh, signpost at the bottom, it's a JPEG. Uh, okay, so here's a picture of the uh, the type of signage that we've been installing in Sandwich and Barnstable and other other areas. It's a very simple four by four post with the uh, town logo on top, a trail name, uh, allowable users, uh, walkers, hikers, and bikers, and the NEMBA logo at the bottom. Um, so there are. So the other, well, it's amazing what you find when you travel through your property. So uh, one, of the, one of the issues that I've seen in other areas is people don't really know what's going on in the woods of the, of the lands that they're responsible for. And uh, this is a swimming pool or a water hole. I don't know. There's a bucket and a slide. So somebody may have, may have excavated that, and then I don't know if they, they bring water out there and then wallow them. So uh, there's one more picture yep. uh, next to that, and this is, we don't know exactly what it was, whether it was some type of kids play facility, a um, bunch of timbers. So these types of things would be part of the, what we would offer the town is we would um, part this stuff away, because obviously having a, a good trail experience, you don't need to be looking at Junk. these types of materials. Um, in, yeah. in on the serious side, we're going to talk about uh, people creating swimming pool, pools and things like that in the woods. Um, what we're attempting to do with the proposition of these two new trails is in, in one case you have a dead end trail and oftentimes it won't get used because it's a dead end, you have to come back on the same trail. Um, in the case of this other existing trail on the southernmost parcel, it just sort of connects across the Great, uh, the great Neck Road. Great, great Neck Road. And again, it brings you out to the road. You can go out to the road and come back again. There is a way to get across the street to go from some existing trails. But creating loops in both of these situations is going to promote use of these parcels. And I, I think that's why these parcels are here are for community use, for all user groups. And we've had this discussion with, with Dan recently that we have a problem with illegal uses on much of our conservation land. Uh, and we are, we are of the firm belief that the more legal users we can get onto this conservation land, the less illegal users you're going to have. So we saw this as an opportunity 
where you have a couple spectacular um, vistas overlooking the river that frankly were not getting really used and we were concerned that the wrong people were going to start to use them. Um, so we, we often get, you know, do we really need any more trails? Um, in, in some cases, I think we do in order to protect the ones that we already have in the open space that we have. So that's a little bit of background and some of our motivation on why we, we want to implement these couple fairly small trails. Any questions? Um, yeah, one of the questions. So the, the trails that you're talking about, the new trails, this is like a brand new trail that you guys are cutting through the woods? These would be new layouts, yeah. They're, they're, not, they're not existing trails. The, the, the terrain in the area would be very straightforward because it's not steep. We don't, we're not, we don't have any erosion concerns to build the trails in this area. Um, and like uh, I mentioned, we, there would be no trees needed. Um, there'd be no earthworks needed as far as cutting in um, bench cuts or anything no. like so that. So then the trail... Just using the, the surface that's there and, and basically taming the brush so that yeah. then you'd be able to... Cut we're we're essentially making a path around the trees. I okay. mean, we're not, we're not removing trees. We're not building hills, holes. We're essentially directing the user around trees to create Experience. Okay, so the trails on the east side of Mashby Woodlands, were those are the existing trails that you guys maintained in work? The, the one that I mentioned, the Great Pine Trail, that was a new trail that we, that we, um, we created there. To that was a, an upland part of the loop because everyone traveling north to south to the east side of the property, everyone had to travel next to the river on the river trail. Right. Um, so the, all the traffic was there, and it, you know, it took some places a little bit sensitive because those had some ser more serious slopes. So uh, the more impact, the more runoff concerns. So having the upland closer to the east side of the property, um, you know, towards the road, that then gave, you know, split the traffic in half. And now people can go one way back and in and out. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Aaron, questions? Sandy. Okay. I don't have any, but I know there's a question from a member here in the audience. So, sir, if I can have your name for the record, and could you come up to the microphone so that people at home that are watching can. Good evening. My name is John Clark. This is my wife, Tara. Um, we live at 25 points away in Nashville, which um, is one of the properties you see on that map. Trail that they would get on that path is hiding in the pasture. Um, my wife discovered the cuttings that they did into the woods and marked it with the color of ribbons all through the trail. The issue we have is the entrance to that trail is less than, less than 15 yards from power property. And not only that, what it is is there's a trail from power property out the river road that's been there since before we purchased the house in 2000. Or they put their, at the beginning of their trail on that trail. It doesn't come from River Road. It comes from the trail that comes from our house out to River Road. Um, we, we really have, on two levels, we would like this to be to deny the application. One is on a personal level is because it has a direct impact upon my wife and I and our neighbors. All through the summer, we've got dirt bikes going back and forth down River Road. One of our concerns is the trail isn't made wide enough for mountain bikes, because I see them, and you can see them in pictures, become trails for dirt bikes. So we, you know, so there's an impact right there, just from dirt bikes riding on the trail for damage they do to the trail. Secondly, there's a noise impact. So for us, for my wife and I, uh, this has a direct negative impact, especially the one that it meanders through John Austin Fox. Our other concern, which is more larger concern, is John Austin Fox is not a large tract of land, yet contains all sorts of wildlife that we observe coyotes, foxes, deer, turtles, and other small animals. 
let's leave it undisturbed there. Especially since so much land has been impacted by humans. We listen to this lady talk about all the impacts in the water. That all came from humans using chemicals, using our environment. To add another trail, we already have an abundance of trails. All of our nasty, a pod, southeast of Mass. They really don't see the need for an additional trail, especially one in an area that is personally undisturbed. I believe the purpose of this board is to conserve and preserve the future generations. To add another trail goes against that principle. Thank you. Let me take it first. I, I'd, Thank you. I'd like to address Okay, and then I'll chime in. Whatever he does. Some, um, some of those items. So um, before the gentleman and his wife um, express their concerns, I believe I, I mentioned to the board that one of the main reasons to put this trail in is to protect this open space, because we do have a very large problem, as evidenced by them hearing the dirt bikes. Um, we have dirt bikes, motorized vehicles ripping up our conservation land. So again, we believe in the premise that the more legal users you put on our conservation land, the less illegal users you will have. So um, that's one thing I'd like to address. Uh, I, I guess the other point I would address is there was a mention that the trail that is flagged um, goes on the trail that comes from their house. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I do a lot of GIS work. I'm pretty well versed in that. The trail that comes from their house is not on their land. Um, <coughs> it's conservation land. So I, I don't think that's a valid I'm argument. Not it's from, I'm excuse not me, sir. Sir, that sir. That sir. Excuse so, me. This speak. protocol, the chairman mm -hmm. will recognize you and you can speak. Can I just add to Dave's comment? Uh, because we were trying to be very careful and cautious about uh, leaving a buffer as much as practical away from private property. Um, that There is an existing trail that goes to a house um, that instead of creating additional, additional new trails, the portion that's on the conservation land seemed ideal to have as the connector because adding more intersections and adding more confusion is, 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 comp is complex. Um, one thing that we do when we have a situation like this is these social trails that come from private properties onto conservation land, I don't personally have a problem with. I think it's great that people have woods to go out to from their house. And I want, as a trail user, to know you know, where I'm going and where I, sh I shouldn't be going. So what we've been doing is we've been adding um, these placards entering private property that we place ahead of going into anybody's private property. So the, the trail has uh, what we propose is to break off of that existing trail that goes to the house. And then if you were to travel a little bit further along the way, you'd see this on a, on a, on a on a tree someplace so that you don't waste your time going down a trail saying, where does this trail go? I don't want to end up in someone's backyard. Right. I'd like to have that information. So that's what we would propose as well. So we, we try to flag the illegal trails that go to private property that have not yeah. been approved so yeah. that they're not used by citizens who are using the approved trails. So let me ask a question. Um, that particular signage that you have, what, what would be the typical setback from the property line of a private owner, if I'm going down that trail and I, there's a sign, it's right in front of my face. Mm -hmm. How far back from the well, private property? Well, it doesn't is say private property, it says entering private property. So, what I usually do is I put it just a short way back down the, towards the trail, towards the private property. So, it'd be on your, on your conservation land just to let people know that trail doesn't go someplace. Um, what you really need or want to go. It doesn't define the property line. Right. We, we want this sign to be close to the proposed trail um, so that if they come to an intersection, 
let's say left is the proposed trail and right, right is the illegal trail that goes to a private property. Mm -hmm. We want signage like that, simple signage, to say, don't go this way, go left. Yeah. That's, that's the trail that's legal and we want you on. That's private property. Yeah, we might even include a blaze of some kind so that you know you're on the conservation land trail. It's just that that yeah. other trail, you'll wonder what is it. And if you had this, it'll at least tell you something. But again, typically, what would be the distance from the exact property boundary in this case? Ideally, you would want to see that from the existing trail. We're, so, we're not venturing off the existing trail right. towards private property to say, you know, private property, private property. When you come to the intersection I described, left is legal trail, right, right is illegal to a yeah. homeowner. Mm -hmm. Right there on the legal trail, you want to make that decision. I'm sure. staying on a legal trail. I'm not going towards someone's private property. My, my sure. thought is, and I, I usually do mock up distances to um, private parcel lines. Mm -hmm. We haven't done that here, but we're normally, I mean, very rarely do we get closer to 70 or 80 feet to a pro private property line. We want the users to have a wilderness experience. We don't want them to feel it's like they're in here. someone's backyard. Right. So in the winter time, you may see someone's house through the trees. Um, ideally, we want you to feel like you're in the woods, right. experiencing wildlife. Um, <laughs> and the other thing we notice is that, you know, we have quite a few trails. When winter comes, we get our first snowfall. We, we talk about wildlife and impacts on wildlife with trails. Very often, the wildlife use the trails. It's, um, you know, they're, they're in the wilderness. They're trying to conserve energy to survive. They don't want to be bushwhacking through Greenbrier. They use the trails. Um, I, I actually think the trails are helpful for wildlife. I mean, there are some situations where it can be questionable. But I think for the most part, certainly the deer use our trail networks. Go ahead, sir. Like can you come up with the microphone? People can hear. So, are you a scientist? Um, yes. What, what kind of scientist? Um, I have a lot of background in engineering. So you've made a lot of broad statements, like you know, about wildlife and the advantage for wildlife. I mean, what I can I that? can provide you with the studies because NEMBA has done the research into impacts uh, like this. Not done the research, but actually assembled the research. Can we get and to we the point? It, can so. we get to the point, please? I mean, yeah. it's getting late. I want to wrap okay, this I, up. I let's let's so finish my, this my up. My question to you is: I've ridden mountain bikes. Yeah. They're fun. They're a lot of fun. I've ridden them on the, in those trails, those existing trails. I don't know why he keeps making a distinction between legal and illegal, but that's the question for another day. I don't know who makes that determination, especially when they've been there for a lot of time. The point I want to make is: I've ridden mountain bikes. I've looked at the app. I'm actually a member. I used to be a past member of this organization. Okay. When you look at their trail maps, there's literally hundreds of them all around us. So the question I have to ask this board is, when is enough is enough? I mean, where do you draw the line and say, we, we have enough? There's plenty of places for people to go. Let's not try to just spoil every part of wherever there's enough. You gave them permission to do a large trail on the other side of the river. Mm -hmm. That should be enough. So that's, that's my contention. Where, where do you draw the line? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other questions? I have. My wife would like to say something. Okay. I walked from the river roadside to where the, the, the box, that the dialogue box says proposed natural surface. Yeah. I can see houses. It's behind residences. So when there's noise, for, and I've been on the walking trails, I go out almost every day, and the one on this side of the river, of the west side, is tight for bikes and people. The other side is, you've got it, what, three feet wide, you said? Three, four feet? That it was cut? I don't know. Most of the trails will end up, initially they'll get cut to be about four feet right. wide, and then well, it really only takes one spring before the vegetation grows in, and then you, Right. Both the walkers and the bikers will establish a tread that's probably 12 to 16 inches wide. My, my point is, 
having walked it for years and having come across bikers um, who are nice, you can't both share the trail. You just can't. There's a lot of people out there. I'm one of them with my dog um, and having some, seeing someone come up really fast. You know, so there's, there's not, um, there, there are not, people are not pol as polite as probably you are. So, but going out on that trail, the other, my concern is, there's right now only two ways, the beginning and the end of the trail to get in, right? The, the one on the south? No, there, there are multiple. So the, if, the, if you the, walk closely, you'll be able to see there's a light, um, a light red line that's in there. There's, there's more trails in there, so you can see. You might need to get closer because I can't see it without my glasses, but there's a lighter dotted line. That's the proposed trail. There are current trails in there. We, we, we need to wrap this up, So the, my point is, okay. the, guys, the trail I saw, A, yep. was marked with ribbons, but it was already cut. Okay. And I walked it, and there, I, there's no, there was no way. If something happened to me, and I called a first responder on my phone, they could get to River Road, or they could get to West Way, but then the hike in to get and take care of somebody would take a long time. What if there was no trail? It would take longer. I, I'm not sure what the point is. Okay. 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 The point is you're behind people's houses, whereas the other side of the east side, the, your, the proximity to residences is not the same. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Um, I have any questions. Yes. So is there a way to um, kind of meet halfway here and Certainly. expand, yeah. get this trail further away from a privacy and setback standpoint so that at least, uh, you know, there can be more separation Absolutely. when it comes to that situation? And my comments as far as I understand your point about that there's an abundance of trails, and you're right, there are a lot of trails. The funding that the town receives to, in order to purchase these lands requires public access. It is a significant part of the reason why towns qualify for state funding to purchase lands like this. So it's not just to preserve wildlife habitat, and I'm not dismissing that, nor am I downplaying it, but a, a, a requirement of the funding when you receive it is to allow for public access and passive recreation and mountain biking, non-motorized riding is passive recreation. So when you say there's an abundance of trails, you have to understand that part of the criteria for receiving a lot of these funds that allow the towns to purchase these lands is to accommodate recreational activities. And I agree 100% with his assertion because I uh, have, you know, I'm always preaching about introducing more responsible usership as the single best way to deter illegal and undesired uses. And, you know, to be quite honest, motorbike riders uh, and ATV riders are going to create trails anywhere they please. It's going to happen. And the best way to deal with that is to introduce responsible activities. We've done it in other areas. It has proven to work. And that is why I endorse this type of approach. I don't think it's going to create the nuisance that you're painting it out to be. <clears throat> and I do think that by allowing more responsible, particularly you know, groups that monitor their activities and have an excellent track record of you know, responsible stewardship like this club does, that is the single best way to deter illegal uses. If you don't have this trail here, you know, it, it could very well happen to become an ATV trail just created by an illegal rider and then you've got a whole different set of problems on your hands. I'm not saying that's going to happen, it may happen, it may not happen, but from my experience, this is a good thing. This is something that will help to deter illegal activities. This is a large parcel. There is ample room to accommodate both habitat and recreational use. You're talking about over 300 acres of land, the majority of which is undisturbed and is set aside for wildlife habitat. I don't see this as a tremendous amount of disturbance to that, and I would endorse allowing the the Mountain Bike Club to create these trails. Okay, thank with, you. With that accommodation of setback, let's find a balance there. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll work with Dan as we worked initially on the flagging to, um, to make sure it meets yeah. your yeah. expectations. I think we need more detailed plans. That's pretty vague, you know. Okay. You know, if we have more detailed plans, shows the property boundaries, shows the abutters property boundaries, you know, and say, okay, I, where are those trails that are you're talking about a survey so just, plan because that's going to hmm? be a significant expense. 
Uh, that that trail location is has been GPX. Uh, right, we, but it's, it's um, you're we, not we, showing we, a lot of information. We could very to easily get you the measurements to the parcel lines if that right, but that it's would not. Help. I don't need the whole parcel, but if you say, okay, this is where the trail end of it. You know, they could overlay it on GIS. Down that, that yeah, would be, yeah, down that corner yeah, of the we property have this on GIS to satisfy now. the abutter and to provide more details. You know, say, okay, where are there illegal trails there? Where, where is that sign going? I think just more information, sure. basically. Yeah. yeah. Sure. So, I would suggest that commissioners take a site visit, uh, go to the property line, uh, okay. see where this trail is going to actually start. Bring a hundred foot tape and tape it off. And that way, I mean, I, we don't need a professional surveyor. No. We've all done this work. We know right. what we're doing. It's flagged. Uh, it's yeah, flagged. but if a, de a detailed GIS plan that shows some th more information. Right. Yeah. 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 It's currently plotted on OSM as a proposed trail. So you, you can look at, you can go to Mass GIS and see this yep. if you put the okay. open space layer on. Okay. So a site visit and then. Yeah, I, I would suggest, um, I would suggest a site visit. Um, look at the GIS map and uh, flag it a little bit so that we have a more definitive mm -hmm. understanding. That's where I was going with the sign, you know, how far back is the setback. Yeah. Um, I'd it, like to it, have it, that. It is flagged yeah. very roughly right now, so you, if you go out on your own, you will be able to follow the proposed trail. Okay. Okay. One, one comment I do need to make, there's two lots right there, right next to ours, that just went on the market last Friday. Mm -hmm. Access is directly onto River Road. If those properties get bought and those houses are built right on those lots, they, people are going to be going into those people's yards. So the thing of it is, is, is they, they're not aware of that. But there's two lots there that are on the market now. Uh, that must be south because that's all conservation no, they, land. No, they, no, he means okay, the east yeah, side on the, on the water. Oh, <laughs> my property. On the water side. I suggest that um, the commission will go out, we'll do a site visit, we'll look at these trails, I'll look at those two parcels as well, we'll tape it off, flag it off, and come back with a, a more definitive plan and numbers, and we'll take it from there. Does that sound amenable to everyone? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if we could uh, place this on our next agenda. Sure. Yeah. We'll schedule a site visit and have a look at it. And if you'd like us to show you, certainly we could, if, if we you could participate could, if you would like us. Yeah, if you could give us uh, some windows of available times and dates, we could certainly coordinate that. Yeah, we have contact with Dan. Yeah, so with we Dan. just email yeah. through me and we'll forward in there and schedule from there. That's not a problem. Okay. So this will move to what, December seven? We're going to look at January 11th. January 11th. For January 11th, Yeah, because December 7th is very, it's very booked. Fun. Very much so. Again? So, again. <laughs> yeah. We do fast that we need to when you do that site visit, please. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, we can loop you in. Absolutely. Yep. And you're at 25, 25 Oyster, Oyster Way. Way. Right. 25 Oyster Way, correct? Yep. I think you said that. That's your address, 25, yeah, 25 Oyster, Oyster Way. Yeah. Okay. 25 Oyster Way. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank, Thank you for your Thank consideration. You. Yep. Thank you. Just the updates. Yeah, so, there's nothing really that's standing out other than um, I did disperse the uh, run size estimates from APCC for the herring run size. If yes. anyone is interested in checking out that, it yep. uh, got sent out to all of you. You will need a magnifying glass probably to read the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that. <laughs> to see all those little fish. <laughs> We will have our land acquisition subcommittee, I mean, I'm sorry, bylaw review subcommittee meeting tomorrow, so there's no updates for that. And apparently working in regards to Chop Chick Bog uh, on construction bid language that will be drafted by town council. I'll send that out to everybody in draft form once council uh, gets back to us with that. We've got a couple of other legal questions for council that hopefully will be uh, given provided to us prior to our next meeting on in December. And um, I think that's pretty much it for okay. updates. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have no additional topics that I have not reasonably anticipated would be discussed other than the trail distances. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
tactics. So if there's a motion to adjourn. So moved. Move. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. Any discussion on that motion? <laughs> Hearing none, Steve? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Sandy? Yes. I vote yes as well. Motion.